right here from 6 to 8 p.m. A recap of all the local sports, high school, college, and more. You can call in and join in on the conversation right here with Good Sports Thursday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. Tune in to 99.9 Whoop FM or always log on to whoopfm.com. Good programming and good sports right here on 99.9 Whoop FM. You're listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Good morning and welcome to Old Town Cleveland here on Whoop FM 99.9 or you can go to the internet at www.whoopfm.com. You can call us here at 614-5553 and welcome. Today is Saturday, March 23rd. Deb, good morning. Good morning, Ron. Good morning. Today oh. is March the 23rd, <laughs> and we're going to be talking about, can't, I can't hear myself, it's the reason I quit talking. Okay. Um, we're going <clears> to... <throat> We're going to be talking about Candy Creek this morning, the Akoi River and the Akoi Dam systems. And we have with us Will Moore, our son, who helped us make the DVD that we're going to be watching tomorrow at Walker Valley School. And, of course, we have the resident expert of most anything with us today, and that's Doc German. Good morning. And I know our listeners always love it when Doc's on the air with us. Good morning, Ron, Debbie, and Will. How are you? Hey, everybody. Go ahead and talk there. I've lost my screen. Go oh, ahead. Oh, no, he's <laughs> lost his screen. But anyway, we're going to have, let's just start off with an invitation here. Everyone listening, we'd like to invite you to come out tomorrow to Walker Valley High School at 3 p.m. to uh, see the documentary that we made about Candy Creek. We interviewed six former residents, and uh, it only lasts about 45 minutes. And our plan at this moment is that when we get there, we're just going to say, hello, how are you? Thanks for coming by. We're going to play the DVD. And then we're going to um, talk to the former residents that will be in attendance. And that should be a oh, lot of fun. That's good. I think, well, uh, I've seen the DVD <laughs> a, few a lot times. of times. Matter yeah, we have seen it a handful of times, editing and everything. It has been almost tiresome but it's still fun to watch every single time uh, well, and i we laugh we at the same lot. parts every yeah time. we do we <laughs> laugh at every single part well this is your very first film project you've been down at chattanooga state working in sort of this type of category uh, yes. uh, or category or, or career and i know you you've got to work on uh, the movie 42 that's correct you which is coming at, out april yeah. the 8th or yeah. 12th um i believe it might be the 12th i'm not sure yeah. but it's really excited about yeah that. It, the trailers are looking great and, so uh, far. but your name won't be on the headlines or anything in that will it um i, I got gypped out of the spot there okay so. and then, he was uh, the big blonde-headed guy on crutches is how they're going to well, list him and yeah. uh then you got to appear on the tv show nashville I, I think you can call that an appearance. Well, what was it, two <laughs> seconds? About two seconds, it yeah. Took, how many took you all day to get that two seconds on there? Twelve hours. Twelve hours. And uh, so uh, the, most of you, uh, they call on the uh, cutting room floor, in other words? Yeah. Okay. A lot of... So it was a great experience. Well, tell us about uh, shooting a, a movie or a film or a documentary in your case. And, uh, you know, your professor said the first people sort of have a do a three or four minute commercial i mean a, a commercial or a three or four minute short you're going to a full length documentary uh well, tell us about it i mean uh, you know um we had no idea what we were getting into <laughs> um by far it was a big big experience i mean there's a reason why people start at two to three minute films 
I was like, yeah, I've done a minute long commercial. I can do a full length documentary. So it's, um, it was hard. It's just hard keeping up with all that information, all that footage, finding everybody. I was taking about 20 calls a day about it. It was overwhelming at times. So like I said before, but, um, well, now the most amazing thing, Will, and it almost makes me mad though, that, uh, uh, here you are, 20 years old when you started this program, and uh, the Chattanooga Times writes a front-page story about this documentary. It has Doc here, who's with us, sitting on the front uh, steps of his original house up in Caney Creek, sitting there talking. How did you get in the front page of the Chattanooga Times when you're 21 and you didn't kill nobody? Well, I think me and Doc are just that good-looking. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Doc, you and him get along fine, don't you? <laughs> That was a really neat experience to take Doc back to his childhood home. And um, we had to have one representative from TVA with us when we went. And I think in the video, I count about 10 extra people that just wanted to go back and see, you know, how what Doc had to say about those foundations that are still there. I guess we probably need to start at the beginning and tell people what Candy Creek is. Yeah, right. Doc, tell them where Candy Creek was. Candy Creek is a mile south of number two powerhouse going up Okoy River towards Ducktown. To get there, you have to park at number two powerhouse and walk back a mile and a half to where the old foundations are. And well, I certainly enjoyed going back. Of course, we went back quite a few times. Uh, I'm ne- I've never seen the film yet, but Ron and Debbie and Will have seen it, so I'm in for a surprise tomorrow afternoon, just like everybody else. We kind of we kind of kept it that way, Doc. Well, we want you to see uh, it for the first time with your family. We've had a couple people that seen some of the early footage and some things, but there is uh, literally no one has seen the entire DVD except Will, Deb, and I. Now. Well, honestly, I have it. Oh yeah, you probably hadn't seen the. I haven't seen After the, the full, title, like, titles, putting yeah. titles and the, correcting the because sound and everything. you want to see it. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. I think that's part of the experience is actually going to see it on the big screen. And i got to stop right here and say that we need to really send out a big shout to Walker Valley High School. Who, Scott Webb. Oh, and yeah. Scott Webb in particular, who opened the door, who will be opening the doors of the high school for us tomorrow and showing the DVD for us. He'll be our tech, tech, tech person tomorrow. And we're really excited about that, and they're really excited to have us there, and it's going to work out really fine. If you're coming tomorrow, you will uh, come in the front gate, obviously, and then you're going to turn left and go in front of the school, and then all the way to the back corner, left-hand corner of the building, and that's where the auditorium and the cafeteria are, um, and that's where you'll park. Yeah, very comfortable seating, uh, easy access. So All on one level. Yeah. Doc, the... Uh Tell us why there was a village called Caney Creek Village. It was Caney Creek Village, and who owned it, and, and why did why did we have such an animal? <laughs> such a place. Uh, well, it started with the East Tennessee Power Company. Then TVA bought them out in 1939, and uh, we had uh, 14 houses there, and, of course, families in every one of them. And there occasionally... Our mothers would tell us, and there's a lot of animals up there, and they'd always tell us, don't bother the animals and they won't bother you. And we, I lived there quite a few years, so no animals never did bother anybody that I know of. And we'd always, if it was a snake or something, we'd bypass it. Well, now, uh, you were well, actually born that? at the village, weren't you, Don? What about yeah. that cat? Cat. What cat? Yeah, I heard you done some surgery on a cat. <laughs> that cat, that, that cat lived. Oh, uh-huh. well, I heard someone else actually did the surgery and you repaired it. But now Geraldine will not admit to that. <laughs> well, and, and that's how you got your nickname, Doc. I understand. Well, Walter Moore lived next door. He seen us operating on that cat, and he nicknamed me Doc. <laughs> and it just stuck after and that. And it lived, hey. Yeah. Were, yeah, were you just practicing, or did it, was the cat sick? A nine-year-old don't know what he's doing to start with. <laughs> yeah. But you can sew it well, up. Well, I, I don't know if we know what we're doing at any But age. the cat lived. Now, but now, Candy Creek was put there because when Powerhouse Number 1 was built and the dam was built, the water backed up, and it covered up all the road, most of the road all the way up to Madden Creek, I understand. Yeah. And so the best way then to get their workers up to this new project that they put on up five miles up the river 
was to just move their people in there. And they had a, a village there was for the carpenters that were building powerhouse number two and the flume line. But they wanted something, I think, a little bit more permanent. So a nicer village was built on the same side as the river as the powerhouse. And that's how it got there is because they couldn't get their workers in there. So if you were a worker in the powerhouse or if you were a worker on the flume line, you got to live where Doc was born at Canny Creek. Right. And that was from 1912 to 1943. The uh, East Tennessee Power Company uh, was owned by Jay Gile something. In, they owned the... Uh, uh, the trolley cars down in Chattanooga, Chattanooga Light and, and power they company. decided to build a dam to provide power for Chattanooga. That's what the reason was. And I think one of the interesting things we found uh, is that the right of ways from Parksville to Chattanooga, they actually bought them. They didn't have easements. Like today you have an easement. Do you sign an agreement to let things go through your property? They actually own strips of land from Chattanooga and then they started furnishing Bradley County. They, ha they own strips of land still today. Now it's TVA. So, but everybody says that Parksville is the oldest dam in the TVA system, which is absolutely correct. But TVA did not build that dam. That's why a lot of people don't realize that TVA wasn't even formed when these guys started building dams, putting electricity. And they did this about the same time they did the uh, Hell's, Hell's Bar. Bar Dam down there, the original dam. And so, but... Uh, uh, these people built the dam in how long? Uh, the first dam in what, 14 months or something like well, that? Well, actually, you know, they started in 1909 and 1910 buying up the property and stuff and chopping down trees and getting ready and stuff. But actually, they broke ground like in January of 1911, and the power was turned on in Jan January 30th, 1912. So it took 13 months to put up that massive dam. Isn't well, that the most incredible you thing? You can't even get permits yet. That <laughs> fast now. Yeah. And and not only that, they built a railroad that ran from 411 Highway all the way up to Powerhouse Number 1. There was a spur off the l &N Railroad there to bring in supplies and stuff because the roads were in such horrible conditions. Of course, you didn't have transfer trucks then. You needed to move things by train. So now what year did you, was you born? Around 1929, 28, 30? 1931. 31, okay. And so that you were born at Candy Creek. Yes, right? I was. So and now you had uh, what? Two more brothers and two, two sisters. sisters. Now I know your sisters were born at Parksville Village. No. 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 Candy Creek. They were all born at Candy Creek. Oh, born at Candy oh, Creek. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. your family live at Parksville Village any? We li we lived there in later life. We oh, lived there okay. Two and a half years, as on up in the middle forties. Now, Parksville Village, part of it's still standing. The buildings are there, and I cover that in my book and make and, and provide it old pictures and new pictures of it. Uh, I believe the TVA use it for some of their office space now, and it's where the little um, uh, Olympian Park is on the um, north, the west side of the of the dam. Mm -hmm. And you can go in there and still see those buildings. And uh, like I say, they're still in use today. And we know where one of them was moved in the 1930s, and it's still in existence. Yeah. Uh, the, if, if To give you a good example where uh, Candy Creek is, if you go up around the Parksville area there, when you get to the uh, powerhouse number two where the flume line comes down, if you're standing there facing that over on the road, there's a little bridge goes over there. You would go across that bridge, and you would turn right and walk away a, a little pathway down along the river and it goes down and then there's a village and then it goes on the railroad went on down to where you would take the rafts out now across from there and there was a wharf there right it's, it's, it's it went all the way down the madden branch on the far side and there's a wharf down there you can see the lower part of it right across the river from madden branch going up parks for lake uh, up 64 highway now it it is not easy access anymore you know since 9-11 uh, things get guarded a lot more so things that has anything to do with the powerhouse is guarded a lot more i think they will give you permission to go down there if but you have to go ask for permission now some people take boats over and in there uh and uh, uh so if you go look at it just leave it and just look at it don't bother anything because there they are concrete foundations there and you can still see remnants of the houses it's a ghost town now. I mean, literally, it, all the the house has actually been moved. I think, Doc, your house that you actually lived at, Canyon Creek, we believe, is right off Dalton Pike now. Is that true? That's what I was told. 
Yeah. Uh, we drove by and seen the house yesterday, and as we turned the corner, I said, that's the Kenny Creek house there. And oh, so the old tennis court is still in Kenny Creek Village. Yeah, it's got a few trees in it now, though. Yeah, trees grow right uh, through the concrete. It, How it, deep do you think that concrete was? How thick do you think it was? At least three foot deep. Yeah, imagine that trees over this amount of time. Well, you know that uh, the concrete they used to build uh, these houses are the same type of concrete they used to build the dam. That's so right. These were p- yeah. pretty permanent. There are pictures. no chunks missing out of anything. The foundations are perfectly preserved. They're kind of eerie looking because they've got moss and stuff growing on them. But you would think that concrete that's been exposed for that long would at least start chipping off and stuff. Well, it's not. We'll see. Fourteen houses. There was a tennis court with lights, right? Yeah, and a fence. Now the, you guys had lights and power and things in the nineteen thirteens all the way up to nineteen forty. We had electricity, running water, sidewalks out in front, lights at night uh, on the pole, but no streets, no no cars, no streets, yeah. just a walkway. We walked on railroad track most of the time. We had a narrow gauge railroad track that run all the way from uh, number two powerhouse down to Madden Branch. You can still see the where that rail line was. I mean, it's still, you know, it's, things are growed up a lot more what it used well, to be. Well, TVA can, keeps it cleared off so that you can get back in Sort there. of a pathway, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us about across the river was what we call uh, Highway 64 going to Copper Hill, right? That's right. Now, it didn't look like that when you were a little boy, did it? It's just a narrow road or something. looked like a wagon trail. Was, and it, was it still dirt? It's still dirt, and they uh, improved that road on up in the early 40s. I remember when we used to leave that, live there, and the leave would come to Cleveland wintertime, it'd be so bad we'd cut it down p- small pine trees and put in ruts. Of course, my dad had an old 29A mall with 21 inch wheels on it. <laughs> and that's pretty well a all day job getting Candy Creek down to Parksville. Wow. That's just five miles? It'd yes. be about an all day job. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. It was a slow moving thing. So now, now had, had they already stopped bringing copper out of the, or were they still bringing copper down that way? Or were they taking it out by rail then? They must have been taken out by rail. I never did see anything moving with copper on it when, when we lived there. Well, they're moving stuff down that road now from the copper mines, aren't they? They sure are. Sure are. That's, that was one of the big problems we had when we went back and recorded, wasn't it, Will? With the noise. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's. That's the problem with all those trucks going back there and people rafting. It's really hard. We had so many things that we could have used, but lost just because there's someone yelling uh, in the background. Or There was one place where there's just a great story, and there's some guy on a Harley. You could hear him coming up from the top <laughs> of the mountain, and uh, you could hear that bike as he got there, and he just drowned out everything we were saying. Then you could hear him driving away because it was probably five minutes. You could oh, hear that Harley probably, going yeah, through there, and you go, terrible. he did nothing else you could do. Just it was live there. Uh, and apparently they're close to the hotel where the hotel used to be. We were standing at the foundation filming. Apparently there's a really big dip in the river there because we would be recording and everything would be <laughs> nice and quiet. And then all of a sudden you'd hear these screams of the people on the river having a good time. But there, there was some uh, great scenes in there. Doc, you'll like this. I know I one the part where Doc is in there talking. And you can hear the birds in the background, and and Doc is talking about it's sort of sad that how it's not grown up, how it's grown up now, and how you someone would have to live there to you know keep it that way, and how clean it used to be, and, and if you see any of the old pictures, it was just a, it was a beautiful look. It, it almost looked like a resort town to me. Uh, you know, so you had a hotel there, and, and the hotel was mainly there for. Uh, people coming up from the Tennessee Power Company that come up to see the dam and things, right? And most of it's for the weekend. We had a lot of visitors on the weekend that wanted to come up and play tennis on the tennis court and, and look us over pretty good because it was real nice village at that time. It was real clean. Oh, it wasn't anything grew, growed up between the houses and the river. Uh, oh, it was perfectly clear, and it's so hard now when you go back there to imagine that there's even enough space there for a house to sit up against the mountainside. Well, looking at the river and, and the pictures, you go, well, that river's awful close to them darn houses. I mean, did you worry about flooding? Well, I don't remember one time many years we lived there, the water got up on the front porch. So it wasn't too, undoubtedly wasn't too bad. In the 1920s, there's a report. I think it was somebody that had lived there in the 1920s later on was telling this story in a newspaper article I read. But they said that 
uh, Big Creek, which was behind, that came out there at the hotel that went into the Okoy River, that Big Creek and the river both, you know, really overflowed. And it came up on the sidewalks and up on the edge of the porches. And they said, but it wasn't a problem. They just hooked up hoses to the fire hydrants. They had fire hydrants and just washed everything off. And you think, fire hydrants. They also had a chlorination system mm-hmm. there to chlorinate the water, which was really important. That was in a day and time when people were dying of dysentery and other things that, that you got, you know, out of the water. So it was yeah. really important. It's strange to see those two old tanks sitting there. Now, it's just, you know, you go, you go down through there and there's nothing. And then here's these two old tanks sitting there. And it's sort of what kind of mysterious project was going on here. Mm-hmm. Doc, what was your daddy's name? Lawrence Sherman. And your mom? Maggie. And uh, now what did Lawrence do at uh, at the uh, park? He was a switchboard operator at number two powerhouse. Now tell us what a switchboard operator did. Well, they operated number two powerhouse by pulling switches, knowing what switches to pull, you know, and uh, getting the power going and getting it out. I watched him many of a time, and my mother was cooking the hotel at Kenny Creek. And it had a commissary and had a, like a, I think that she cooked mainly just for the visitors, is that right? Or was yes, it? For yeah. the visitors, yes, for visitors. And the, we think the hotel probably had 12 to 15 rooms in it. And it wasn't like you could come as an individual there and stay. A lot of times it was the Tennessee Power Company um, officials. officials. If somebody moved in... Somebody moved out of a house and somebody knew was moving in. Well, they'd paint it and everything, and the family would have to live in the hotel for a few days. It's, it was kind of interesting that they thought to put it there, and a lot of people remember the McClary's. They mm-hmm. ran a, a hotel for us. And we do have a picture of them on the documentary, show their picture, and um, I think Mrs. McClary must have been quite the... Um, everybody talks about knowing Miss McClary, so she must have taken care of a lot of people up there. Oh, there's, I can't give away some of this stuff because uh, there's some stuff that Doc says that, uh, well, you better bring your uh, uh, something to wipe your face because you're going to laugh so hard till you cry. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Doc's got some. One and we had, then we had a Ms. McClary also was our school teacher at our, our big schoolhouse. I think it was 18 foot long and 14 foot wide, mm-hmm. but had one through nine, one through eight grades there. I found a newspaper article that said that it was probably one of the smallest operating schools in america and that that in 1934 it was still first grade through eighth grade and then the next year they took the older kids by bus to um, benton and so that they could go all the way through high school and graduate which many of them did it's amazing the number of teachers and things that came out of that little community almost that, all of them yeah it seems like. Yeah, yeah, we've had... All the uh, ladies just about made school teachers. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Linger Felter, that was in the um, in the in in our documentary, she um, came to school there when she was in the sixth grade in 1934. And uh, she went on to be a school teacher that a lot of people in Polk County will remember. Okay. Uh, the... Uh, the flume line. Did you ever get to ride on top of that flume line on that little train? Rode on it many of a time. Now, what was the view up there? It's unbelievable. You can see anywhere you want to see. We couldn't get our our, our main photographer, uh, and every, he done everything. And he he photographed and cleaned the rooms and everything else. Uh, <laughs> couldn't get him to ride on top of that train up there. You you have a problem there, don't you? Um, I have a slight phobia of heights, <laughs> to say the least. Um. We tried to get cameras on there, um, and luckily they told us we couldn't, for my sake. <laughs> well, I think uh, we, we actually found some footage. Uh, there's some on YouTube of, I think, Lewis Lee. Yeah. Actually, when he worked for Channel 12, got to ride there. So that's great. I, I hated to break Will's heart when he was younger there. He he come in, uh, We said that he wanted to be an astronaut, and I told him, well, if you have a phobia of heights, astronaut goes really high <laughs> yeah. that might, he said oh, oh yeah. okay so he sort of changed his mind from that uh uh early day well uh i know when we first started this and, and much like me uh had heard of candy creek but really didn't know all the stories about it and mm-hmm. and then you got to walk back up in here and see the, all these foundations and uh 
what was your first reaction seeing all this stuff appear that you know it was it it looks like you know just if you come around the corner in the woods and you all of a sudden you seen this little village here mm-hmm. that what used to be there just almost eerie isn't it yeah it's almost creepy if you don't know the story behind it but like if i just walked back there on a normal day and i didn't know i was back there it would be pretty haunting you would think that you know what happened to the people that lived here yeah yeah but um it's almost like i said in the documentary it's almost bittersweet now knowing the story because it's we know dot's story and we know mrs trotter's story and everyone else's story and they're just so wonderful to hear but i think the thing that amazes me is that if you ask anybody doc's age that grew up in Polk County that didn't live at Grant Candy Creek. Well, they would tell you that they may have walked to school right. and they didn't have electricity and they didn't have indoor plumbing and they they didn't have all the modern conveniences that Doc had. They they plowed and they milked cows and they walked to school. And so it's a whole experience just a handful of people had and we've managed to capture that on film. Yeah. That's great. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. How you doing, Ron? I'm doing fine, Brett. How you doing? Good. How you doing, Will? Doing great, Brett. How you doing? Good. Hey, Ron. Yeah. Don't forget, uh, Atlanta opens their season on Monday. Monday. All right. That quick, isn't it? You know who they play? No, I don't. The Phillies. The Phillies. Okay. Yeah. Down in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, wow, that sounds that sounds like fun. Is this regular season or just the uh, uh, preseason? It is the regular season, Rod. Oh wow, that quick! I I thought it usually around. Well, it is April first next week. Today, well, today is the spring training still. Yes, that's right. Boy, boy, it is that. I'm tell you, I'm I'm You're behind, Rod. Yeah, I am behind. <laughs> All right, and what else going on, Brett? Mark Madness is today too. That's right. Who's you? Who are you picking to win it all? I got uh, UNC North Carolina, North Carolina the the Tar Heels. I'm going with Harvard. And I got Louisville. All right. Hey, don't forget Tennessee plays today at one thirty. One thirty. What channel do you know? It's on ESPN two. ESPN two. Okay. And the team from Chattanooga is going to be on TV too. Oh, the UTC mocks? Yes. Uh, what? Where are they playing at? Do you know? In Texas. All right. All right, Brett. Well, thank, thanks for letting us know there, and keep it. And uh, we'll be watching. All right. All right. All right. Thanks. I like. I have to say thanks to Jim Sites. He came by, and he and his wife were cleaning out their garage, and brought me a 1978. Um, map of Bradley County, which will really help me on my house project I'm working on. Yeah. And it's got Doc's ad in here when he ran Rebel Motors down on Spring Place Road. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Good morning, Ron Depp. How you doing? Hey there, Bully. How are you? I just want to acknowledge something. I think, I don't know if anybody's heard about it or not, but uh, Mr. Don Gaston passed away. He was a well-known wrestler. And right. Don Carson. Yeah. And uh, my brother used to work for him. And uh, I met him back in the 60s. He's a uh, I always liked him, and I hate to hear that. Yeah, I, I'd heard that, uh, oh, last week, uh, or what was it, last Sunday or Monday or something like that, he had passed away? Yeah. Yeah, I heard it somewhere there. And, uh, yeah, uh, I remember Don come in here to Whoop Radio uh, one morning on one of the morning shows and just created an unbelievable sensation, people coming down to see him. So, And I think he worked for the Sheriff's Department for a while also. Yes, he did, and like I say, uh, I got to know him a little bit myself, and uh, he once got me in a sleeper hole, uh, and uh, it actually was making me kind of go darker, you know. Uh, he, was, he, he, was, he was kind of Doug Matthews and him, and uh, mm-hmm. when I worked for Doug, he come in there and got me in a sleeper hole, and uh, anyway, he's, I miss him, and, he, and like I say, it was just, uh, I think he had Alzheimer's or something like that, and uh, I just want to acknowledge him. Yeah, well, thanks for calling and reminding me, because I was going to mention that, and uh, I, I can't remember what I had for breakfast now, but... Uh, me neither. Hey, Bullet, you going to try to come up and watch the documentary tomorrow? Yes, I am. I'm going to be up there. Well, Good hey, we love to see you up there. Doors, uh, the doors will open at 2 o'clock, and we're going to show it right at 3 o'clock. Where about is it going to be? It, it's it, in Walker Valley. If you go to uh, to the high school, as you go in the front gate, yeah. you bear left and go to the back. 
Oh. You'll, you'll go to the left side of the school and go away to the back, and it's uh, the auditorium's back in the back part there. Okay. I'll Almost like you're going up to the football field, but you don't. You stop before you turn to go up to the football field. I'll bring my brother too, and uh, so uh, we'll see him tomorrow evening. Then. Good hey, deal. Good to see you. The Bye. doors will open right after two o'clock, so you can get there early and and uh, you'll be there. And we hope all our, uh, all the people who uh, listen come up. And uh, if we haven't met you, we'd love to meet. Uh, all of our listeners, so this is a chance for you to come see us. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Hey, thanks, thanks Bullet. Appreciate it. Hey, Deb, uh, I want to make an announcement real quick here. Uh, the uh, I can't get the, it's the SSPW is having a steel cage match for the heavyweight title featuring Tommy Cage, uh, Gage and Matt Gilbert down at the uh, uh, Dalton Convention Center next Saturday. At Tick, 7 30 p.m. Yeah, the tick, I'll tell you more about it. Tickets are ten dollars each. Three dollars go to the <laughs> Wounded Warrior Project. Good oh. morning. You live on Old Town Cleveland. Hello, Ron and Debbie. Hey, Miss Ella. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> you just called the flirt with Doc. I know what you're doing. I called and told him I was listening. <laughs> Did you go dancing last night? Huh? Did you go dancing last night? No, I didn't. You getting old? No, I can't go until I get my check. <laughs> <laughs> I figured she's too drunk to get out the door or something. <laughs> Not unless somebody will pay my way in a cab. <laughs> yeah, but wait till next weekend. She, she'll be there next weekend. Nope, she's still got well, weekend I'm thinking about waiting until the 6th because I'm going to get this pretty red dress. Oh, a pretty red dress. All right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to call and tell you that the Senior Center is having a prom uh, the 3rd or 4th. Thursday in May, mm-hmm. but they need somebody to play for them, but they can't pay anything. So you want a free band? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Free okay. Band. You know, free bands are not as good as paid bands. <laughs> I know. <it. laughs> well, last time they just played CD, but we need a band. I asked Pro Daddy. He said, "Yeah, but you know how Pro Daddy is." <laughs> well, now, uh, what what kind of music you want? Like heavy metal or rap? Oh, no, like like the 50s. Oh, the 50s stuff. You want some old twisting music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I heard Doc can twist and go all the way down to the floor and back up. He has. He has with me. He made him dance a lot. I brought a picture down there one day. I don't know if they put it on the air or not, but, but I wanted to know what that CD was about uh, that song of mine. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing on me. I never could find it. Oh, I have no idea. Does Debbie know? <laughs> no, I mean, we. No, who was supposed to make it for you? No. Debbie? No, we, we gave her a CD for one of Freddie's CDs. Oh, she gave you Freddie's CD that has it on there. Yeah, well, I didn't, they didn't know how to find it. Yep, it was laying here on the counter, so. Oh. What, Some, what, somebody has taken it. All righty. We'll, we'll look for it. <laughs> uh, what does it look like? Is it that yellow one? Oh, I don't know what it looks like. It's a CD. Yeah, we'll find it for you. All right. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. I think she thinks that we made a CD of her singing out loud. No. The day she sang. Okay. No, okay. it's, it's, yeah, it's Freddie Hyde. Yep. Done that. Anyway, back to the wrestling thing down there. There's 10 different matches. The Rock and Roll Express is there and Terry Lawler and uh, Cyrus the Destroyer. But this is down... This is a, a big time wrestling thing down. The, they'll sign autographs from five to seven, and um, they got music down there. Be Johnny and the Jacob Deal Band. Don't know them, but it sounds that sounds like a good name. Johnny and the Jacob Deal Band. All right, so sounds interesting. So don't forget to go do that down the wrestling down at the Dalton uh, Convention Center next Saturday night at seven thirty is bell time. Tickets ten dollars. That's a deal. A great deal, and three dollars go to the Wounded Warrior Project. So that's a great help there. Um, now tomorrow afternoon, if you like that documentary, we're going to autograph it for you. That's, that's right. right. Yeah, we do have DVDs in, for sale in the books and everything. Uh, the doors will have open right around two o'clock tomorrow, a little after two, and uh, the film will show right at three o'clock. We ain't going to wait. We're going to show this thing at three o'clock, and it'll be over in about forty-five minutes, and then ten or fifteen minutes, you'll have an opportunity to. 
to meet and greet people like Doc German. I think Miss Kirkland is most likely will be there. Yes, Miss King. King will be there, and then uh, now Miss Linger Felton would have to come from Alcoa, and we know she's been in rehab. And I didn't hear from them this past week, but they were planning to come if she's at all able. Mm-hmm. Now, well, there's uh, a, a little sad moment here. I, you know, you, you got the opportunity to meet Miss Trotter. We did, yes. Uh, Margaret Poe Trotter. Is that, did I get all of her names? Yes, that's all right. right. Uh, she was. Uh, uh, she lived there, and then she became a teacher, and and she was taught Sunday school classes and all this stuff. And uh, uh, some interesting things happened when we interviewed her and stuff. You want to talk about the the whole story about her? Will yeah. Um, we um, got a call from her family telling us to come on down to interview her. And where was she located, Mom? At, in Blue Ridge. Blue Ridge. That's right. She was at the Blue Ridge Retirement Center when we went to visit her that day. So we walked through the door, and she was just the sweetest lady we have ever met. She was all smiles and just laughing and everything like that. Um, She was a great storyteller, almost as good as Doc. Yeah. That's a good thing to say. She but, didn't um, tell as many lies, though, did she? Oh, no. Oh, no they weren't quite <laughs> as colorful as Doc's stories. Yeah, not as colorful, but... um. As we took a break to um, reset some of our equipment, she was telling us how glad she was that we were doing this because um, she only had a month left to live. She had, um, I believe, cancer, correct? I think so. Um, so, which would, it was impossible to tell. This woman has so much life inside her, for especially her age and her medical conditions. She was just a wonderful lady, and I know it took... M- Everything I had and probably everything mom had just to hold it together in the interview or because it was just. I think just, what moved me about that moment was Will and I both, it was probably obvious we didn't know what to say when she told us that. And she said, it's okay. I've had a beautiful life. Mm-hmm. And we somehow sucked it back up and carried on. It didn't bother her at all. On the car ride back home, though, it was pretty rough. <laughs> but now the one thing that she did do, she told us, she said, I have this quilt in my cedar Mm. chest and we went in we walked in with her she was on some kind of walker or something and it was like opening a treasure chest her husband's world war ii uniform was laying on the top Mm -hmm. and obviously baby outfits from her children that were probably born in the 40s and the 50s and um how i would have loved to have gone through that chest with her but she did pull out this quilt that was made in 1934 by the women at Kenny Creek, and the reason they made the quilt was to raffle it off to raise money to have a Sunday school there. And uh, it was just, it wasn't anything fancy. No, not at all. And she says in the video, she's telling us about it in the video, and she said it's not anything fancy, but it meant the world to her because she had such great memories of Kenny Creek and the people who lived there that she associates with that quilt. Yeah. Uh, Now, after you filmed the, the sad news... Mm-hmm. After after the filming, twenty days later, she died. Oh yes, um, uh, she died about twenty days after filming, and um, I mean, I really wish we could have been able to put it out so she could have seen it. But I know her family will be there, mm-hmm. um, and I know they'll. This will be something that they'll really cherish. I hope, and. That made this documentary for me. I mean, just to know that they have something to hold on to was her. Uh, the picture of you and her together is, uh, Will, you look like a mountain standing next to her. <laughs> I have that effect on some people. <laughs> uh, Will's about 6'4", the hair, and, uh, and 200, little and tiny. 200 plus pounds. How's that, Will? I think the funny <laughs> surprise to us was that her family had taken her back to Caney Creek and not, it went for her 87th birthday. <laughs> and so we had taken Doc back, and then when we found out that she had been taken back, that's why that's when we decided to call the, the video Going Home because these two people had gone home. And um, it's really funny to see her talking about going because she talks about uh, they didn't take her in the, the gate at TVA. They took her across the river, her granddaughter and um her granddaughter's husband 
took her across the Koi River in a raft, and her 87 years old. And the one thing that she says on the video that I don't think made the final cut was she says, I've always been a go-getter, and uh, it was real cute. Do you remember her, Doc? She was quite yes, a bit I older. Do. Mm -hmm. I remember well. Fine lady. Seemed to she, be. She was also a pal with my two sisters, Inez and Opal. Yeah. Now, one other thing happened in the while we're filming her that no <laughs> one knew until we started editing the film. We'll tell what happens when she starts talking about the little girls that give the quilts the parts of their dress or their old dresses to make the quilt. We had a little bit of an audio bug during that part, which kind of sounds like a small girl crying. Now, I put that off as a audio quirk, and I think Ron has watched a little too much <laughs> Ghost Hunters. It well, is, we'll just say that there were no other funny sounds anywhere no, no. until we got it, the quilt. It is weird. It is, it is weird. an EVP, they call it in the ghost hunting world. It's an electronic voice phenomenon. It's a little girl crying behind her as she talks about the little girls getting See, it up sounds like somebody dresses. playing to me. But it wasn't anybody there because it was stone quiet that day. It was. Yeah. But it, it is kind of funny. And then when we've tried to take it out, her voice echoes a little bit at that part. But it's okay. Doc. Let's go back to Candy Creek. What did you do up there for fun? Well, I mean, you're out in the middle of the mountains. There was nothing to do, right? Well, on Friday afternoon, we used to watch Raymond Roddy ride his motorcycle across the bridge going to Cleveland. Then we'd be there Sunday afternoon, watch him come back in. He rode a motorcycle across that little narrow swinging bridge one side of the lake to the other one. And us boys would come fight each other for entertainment then sometimes we'd ride a bicycle off into the river and one of the boys would tie a rope to it and they'd pull it back out did anybody oh, have a rope on you nope they should have <laughs> <laughs> now doc couldn't swim but he was i started to say bra i didn't know whether to say brave or crazy wild enough let's use the word wild enough that he'd ride that bicycle off into the river knowing now, that they what, had the rope around did the Did you bike. get up on the hill and come down there real fast and jump <laughs> off in the river? There's a small hill right behind our house where we'd get up a little bit of speed while we are going out in the river a little bit farther. And so how deep was the river? Was it running? Oh, I don't know. I never did touch bottom. <laughs> <laughs> it's moving pretty fast in that area. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. I didn't realize uh, Doc Gerber was in there. <laughs> uh, I did. I do want to talk to him, and say hi. <laughs> How are you, uh, twin? Oh, I'm just fine. Dancing all the time, Doc. You've not been drinking lately, have you? <laughs> I drink a couple. <laughs> You're gonna have to cut that out. A couple of an hour is just too much. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, it keeps me slim all that dancing. Just keep dancing and leave yeah, it drinking but, along. But that beer will put it back on you. No, it won't. Not as long as I dance and walk. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was wondering um, if the, anybody at the Revelers are listening, that if they would come and play in the prom, that would be fine because they have played before at the Senior Center. Anybody that's listening at the Revelers? Al the Ramblers? Okay. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Or a Chevrolet would be all right. Mm. You know, Doc, uh, you told some other stories about this guy riding his motorcycle, too. What You said he used to have some, he might have, when he drove, the, a big motorcycle, wasn't it? It was a big Harley Davidson. And that bridge wasn't that big, was it? No, that bridge only about four foot wide, and it went one side of the river to the other. It was a suspension, yeah. a swinging and bridge. It, yeah, it was a swinging bridge. It was so not a stable that bridge. Mo that motorcycle right. probably swung a lot, too, didn't it? Well, it went up and down quite a bit, but we used to enjoy watching him ride across there. Right now, sometimes I understand he had a passenger with him. Yes, when he came back to end, most of the time he had a passenger with him. Um, a different lady his brother friend. or something? <laughs> I wouldn't think so. It wasn't his brother? No, no. I okay. don't think so. Had he had we a, didn't question him too much. Did he have a drink or two sometimes? I'd say so. <laughs> Well, now, when he was sober, was it harder getting across the bridge? I wouldn't rode it sober or drug. <laughs> okay, well, that tells you, if somebody will go off if, into the river. If Doc <laughs> wouldn't have done it, we know that. Uh, Maybe it shouldn't have been done. Doc, I know that you, uh, you're just an amazing memory here. Tell us the people that live there. A few of them. Well, Don Gaston lived there, Rat Green, 
uh, Earl Belt, Bill Vineyard, a couple of Merrills, Mr. McClary, Lawrence German, and uh, Hugh Smart and A.C. Rimer. They lived up at number three version down. And uh, Frank Lowe lived in uh, one of the houses. And Bob Woody. I don't have a picture here. We might can name them all off. The Gastons were there, too. Yeah, you yeah, said Gastons first. Cries. Yeah. We had two cries, Manny Cry and Frank Cry. Mm-hmm. That was now, cousins. Um, Hugh now, Martin and A.C. Reimer lived up at the Diversion Dam. What was their job? They w- looked after the gates that, where water went through the flume line that come down to number two firehouse. They were uh, gatekeepers. Now, we're one of the last places in America that has actually an operating flume. Doc, tell everybody what the flume is and why it's there. The flume line is at number three version dam, which is a small dam. It's originally wood under that dam. I think we've concreted over it now. In the 1980s. This is where people put in the rafts now. Yeah, yeah. Talking about this right, is exactly the rap right. entry. Yeah. And they were gatekeepers, make sure no trash went down the flume line across the river where the put the rafts in that now and that flume line goes down for five miles and goes into a big pond up above the powerhouse and they usually in bad weather would have people what they call rake the racks to get the trash off the racks before it got in turbines down at number two powerhouse. So it comes four point seven miles mm-hmm. this wooden flume line does. And the water's rushing down through there. Really fast. Really fast. And every 15 feet or something there were chains that hung across there down into the water so if one of the workers it's an open top except for the railroad at the top Mm -hmm. if somebody fell in there they were supposed to be able to grab those chains and pull themselves to over to the side and wait for help is that right my dad fell in one time and he happened to grab a whole chain they got to him real quick that water is is, uh i'd say it's running 40 miles an hour through that flume line. Yeah, it's going really fast. Now, they divert the entire river, the entire river well, pretty flume much. Line on that mm-hmm. flume line. And then the picture's up here now, I think. That That's the original wooden flume there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, over the years, they have replaced parts of it with steel girders to hold it up over those big ravines. Uh-huh. But for the, And then they uh, put uh, some solid wood on the insides lined it again in the 1940s i know that your grandfather worked on it then but now willie gregg tells me that she had an uncle a great uncle that probably was in the original flume people that actually fell in and they never found him now when you walk that flume line see them boards up there on it yes that's as wide as they are Mm -hmm. i've walked them before and it's really really scary it that looks that about eight inches wide. Eight to twelve inches wide yeah. is what it looks like to me. And you there's just no have no handrail over there. There's no handrail. No handrail no at all. And then in the center is a short gauge railroad. Now, what kind of car or vehicle was up there, Doc, when you were growing up? They had a, a 1928 Chevrolet uh, <laughs> pickup truck, red with uh, black fenders on it. That used to pull a flat car up there. I do not. I could not find a picture of that, folks. I looked so hard for a picture of it. What we do have is a picture of some kind of little trolley with a flat car behind it that's up on the screen now, and it'll be in the um, documentary tomorrow. And you can see that that is open except for that eight-inch board on each side of the. I think that's fourteen foot across, and there's a a board right at the edge on both sides. And I can't imagine walking on that board, especially where those ravines are. And then down the center, there's a solid piece of wood, and then it's got the railroad track. And they use that to move people and supplies to, to go repair the flume. I understand that, Doc, when you lived there, it was a full-time job for people to repair the flume and keep it cleaned. And They kept, had a crew there every day that repaired that flume line. They kept the brush away from it. Exactly right. Now, they don't do that as much When anymore. I left there, I got to racing motorcycles and stock cars, and lots of people said, don't you get scared? After living at Kenny Creek, that was minor about getting scared. <laughs> now, the flume yeah. line would get hit by trees <laughs> falling on it or oh, rocks rock, coming Rock, rock, most of the time yeah. fall on it, yes. But that was a pretty sturdy uh, Oh, it was thing. built real well. Yeah, that and... Uh, I not, was built mostly in Depression days. Well, you had to give a good day's work, you know, and they done their job right. They were happy to have jobs, too. I know that Mrs. Uh, 
Mrs. Trotter's dad, Edgar Poe, had been working for the Ellen N. Railroad and had a really good job, and they were living in Etowah. Well, one day you had a job, next day you didn't. And um, her mom had been a city girl. They'd always lived in Knoxville, and Etowah was the smallest place she ever lived. And at that time, Etowah was a pretty big railroad town. And so when her dad got hired at Candy Creek, here they come up around that river road, and her mom says, "Well, you get me in here, you'll never get me out." Is what she says on the on the video. And you think about those families, those mothers that were um, moving into there. They had to be really apprehensive about living out in the the wilderness like that. But then all of a sudden, it had power, it had running water. They were getting refrigerators when nobody else had refrigerators. Also, indoor plumbing, which was unusual back in those days. Well, yeah, it, well, really unusual, you it know, sure to, unless you lived in the big city. Uh, we interviewed uh, Margaret Poe Trotter and Troy Moore Lingenfelter, and they both had been teenagers when it closed down. They had just graduated from high school the year that they had to move out or right close to that time. But the only living adult that was a young wife and mother that we could find there um, was Mrs. Green. Anna Ruth Lillard Green. She was the wife of Rat Green, right. which you remember, Robert right. Rat Green. And she had gotten married in 1933. So here's Will and I interviewing somebody that wasn't born in 1933. She had gotten married in 1933. She was going to be 99 years old, 10 days after we interviewed her. And she's still living. She mm -hmm. lives in the house next door to Polk County High School. I don't know if her family will be able to bring her tomorrow or not. I did send them an invitation in the mail. Okay. Uh, Doc, how long, how often did, uh, you know, we know now that the, you know, the rafters and TVA are a constant battle of how much water they can have down the river to run that. Because, you know, basically me growing up, I was born in 54, that, I never really saw that river running down there because it was always going through the flume line. Exactly right. So, so how often did the water not go through the flume? I mean, was it up on the flume all the time? That it always went through the flume line, but they, the rafters or the operators of the rafting got some kind of a bill passed where they would have certain days of the week where they'd put water down the uh, road uh, water bed. So, but now, when you was a little boy, did you ever see them let the water down the river? No, never. Oh, that water went on the old time down the river. And well, see, in front of Kenny Creek, it already line. came out of the flume line. But it came line. out of the flume line not after under number two firehouse. Yeah. The, uh, I know probably in, the, was it the early 70s that the flume line had some 1980s. major damage or they were going to have to rebuild it all? Then all of a sudden, we realized. There's a white water river up here. Yeah. And <laughs> right. then that's when that, and then that's when the flume line got done, now people wanted, now they, that's when the argument started. That's when the fight started. Yeah, good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Yeah, uh, as my memory, I used to ride up the river all the time with my dad. He worked out of Benton and always had to go to Copper Hill. And never saw the river run until they had to do the <laughs> Who is this? My this name's David. Hey, David. Yeah, David, I, I'm the same way. I never mm. remember this, ever seeing the river run and... I remember my dad uh, and uh, would tell me that my grandfather, my grandfather and uncle had worked on the flume line somewhere along the way, which a lot of men in mm -hmm. my my It was TVA from, days. Yeah, I was from Tinga, Georgia. They'd go up there and work on that because it was work. WPA work. Yeah. Uh, David, I do remember that, too, that you basically had five miles of the riverbed that was dry, and then you had water after the number two power plant for about five miles, and then you had the lake. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. Did you swim in Parksville Lake when you were young? All the time. Well, what was so funny is I'd always wear my bad bathing suit when I went to Max Point to swim because of the chemicals and stuff in the water. Little was I thinking about my skin and my body. <laughs> <laughs> but I was really worried about my bathing suit getting eaten up. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Miss Lingerfeld was my... Uh, sophomore English teacher in high school. Well, David, I hope that you can come tomorrow. You'll get a big kick out of seeing her. She's 93 years old, and she's got, still got her hair dyed red. <laughs> she told us stories about Candy Creek all the time. She was so excited the day uh, Will and I went there. She's um, She had just gotten out of rehab. She had fallen and broken her shoulder, 
and she had just gotten out of rehab, and she called and says, okay, I'm ready now. You can come talk to me. And while we were there, she had her grandson to take down the very decorative picture above her couch and put up her picture of Candy Creek. <laughs> but she was delightful. Her daddy is wanting to give me my nickname. Okay. Mr. Moore, yeah, and he was the carpenter. I think that he had a whole lot to do with keeping that uh, the flume line fixed. And I, I bet you remember Copper Hill didn't look like it does today, does it? Uh, not at all. It was. I'll never forget the first time I went through Boyd's Gap. I was probably five years old, and I thought this is what Mars looks like. Yeah. Well, I, when they landed on the bit the moon, I thought, well, big deal. I can get in my car and go to Copper Hill, and it looks I, just like that. I, I, you know, my my son, who's twenty one, sitting here has never really seen copper hill like it was in i mean there was not a tree a bush a blade of grass no topsoil it was just red all the way down to the rock and you remember the sahara motel yeah i don't in the desert. but i do mm-hmm. remember um i had relatives that lived there uh i believe in duck town or right there in the Copper Basin somewhere. I just remember going there to those company houses, and they'd get out and sweep their driveway and their grass, their yards, because there was no grass growing there. Exactly. It's a different world today. It It sure is. You know, like I said, the whole whole river, you know, and when they built the flume line, you know, looking at the old pictures, you know, we drive by there now, there's a lot of trees in front of it and behind it. Well, they'd cut all those trees down to make the lumber, for the flume line so there was no trees eight million and, 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 board feet of lumber you know, or something and, uh, crazy now, like that time when you was born doc was trees starting to come back by then oh yeah we we had quite a few trees by yeah. then but you yeah. know when they first cut it they had to cut they just cut trees to anywhere they could find a tree they right. cut it down that there, there was no epa back in no hey david there's a picture of doc and although it didn't make it didn't make the dvd i i think it's a very interesting picture of um of him standing by a tree that he remembers being there by his house, and it was just some little sapling when he was a little boy. Now it's a great big tree, and uh, he wanted his picture made with it because he remembered it so well. What else do you remember about the river, David? Uh, well, uh, you're talking about Rat Green. Yes. His son-in-law died in the river. Oh, how, I didn't know that. Who was his son-in-law? Eddie Ledford. Oh, he did. He had a car wreck going. He taught at the high school. Right. And had a wreck going to work. Yep. Yep. Now, his wife was not born at Candy Creek, but his sister-in-law was. Right. Um, Betty Jo that runs the quilt shop, she was actually right. born there. And we have a picture of her about four or five years old, I guess, when they left there. Yeah, Betty Jo was a teacher at school, too. Absolutely, for years and years. Now, Mrs. Green and Rat Green uh, moved out of Candy Creek, and her husband called. And ask on the phone, does this house have running water? And the, the owner said, yes, it does. They were one of the first families that left Candy Creek when TVA took over. And uh, so they just rented it over the phone. Okay, we'll take it. Well, when, they, when, we, when they got there, the definition of running water was different. It was a pump at the kitchen sink and the outhouse out up on top of the hill. And they... <laughs> And Mr. Green had lived in Candy Creek, all, you know, around Candy Creek all of his life. And so he wasn't quite used to those kinds of uh, um, facilities. So he, um, uh, they had to rent a house that was a little bit more modern than that and had a, trouble finding one. But Mrs. Green is the only living adult that we could find that had actually lived there as a young mother and wife. And, and of course, like we say, she's just a few weeks away from being 100 years old. David, do you, anybody else you remember up there? Uh not really. I, I I was could moved in right before I started school and moved out right as soon as I graduated. Right. Well, that like I say, it's a it's a great story and uh, uh, I engineering feat. Do what? The whole flume is an engineering. Oh, oh it's yeah. incredible oh, when you think is. that they built it up on the side of that mountain. They in 1912, and their biggest tools they had were picks and shovels. They used dynamite like crazy. It's one they hadn't killed more people than got killed. And they had a gas-powered jackhammer. And that's what they used to make that. And if how many feet does it fall from the beginning to the Only end? Only like 17 or 19 feet. 19 feet. And that makes it pick up that speed. And there's some place that it, it kind of looks like it's running backwards because it's a little bit higher. Um, I think they've had some trouble with that spot. Well, David, we hope to see you tomorrow at the documentary. I plan on being Three o'clock, there. Walker Valley High School. All righty, thanks for calling. Thanks, David. Um, 
I love our callers. Yes. They're uh, great. Will? Yeah. Uh, if you had it, I'll do it again. What would you do? One thing you'd do different. Oh, only one thing? Yeah, you only get one thing. Um, know what I'm doing? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, uh, you know what, Will? Uh, it's, uh, it turned out pretty amazing. I mean, it may not be uh, an Oscar winner this year. Uh, we might have to wait till next year to win the Oscar. <laughs> right, yeah, but, that's, uh, that's peace, yeah. Uh, we family, saved a lot of history. P- pretty darn good stuff, yeah. though. Right. It really is. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Good morning. I wanted to ask Doc German if he knows Maggie Goforth. Maggie Goforth. I sure do. Maggie Goforth was my mother. Well, I figured you'd know her then. <laughs> what about Buddy, Buddy German? Well, he was my oldest brother. He did a lot of research there on the. He, he wrote there. a book on Kenny Creek, but I don't have it. Uh, uh, I understand my niece has got it, and he had a lot of pictures of Kenny Creek that I got part of them. And uh, what about Larry Mor- What about Larry Morgan? Do you remember him? I remember him well. <laughs> sure do. I spent a lot of time with you. Lawrence on his front porch, him telling me the old day about the old times up there. I really enjoyed. Well, he's a pretty good talker. Yeah, he's a lot better talker than I am. I was a good listener. I was a good listener. Unfortunately, my memory's so bad, I can't remember half of what he told me. But I spent many a day sitting on the front porch. My brother and I used to race motorcycles. My brother got hurt. And uh, I brought the motorcycles back in home one Sunday afternoon. I left my brother in Rome, Georgia, with a broke leg. He took an axe and chopped them motorcycles oh. up. Well, you'd still so, like to have those now, wouldn't you, Doc? I sure would. Well, Doug, I hope that you join us tomorrow. I'm looking forward to meeting you tomorrow. All righty. Sounds good, dear. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Folks, we're going to take a few minutes to... Pay some of the bills here and recognize our sponsors, and we'll be right back with you. W-O-O-P, L-P, Cleveland, Tennessee. Debbie Moore, co-host of Whoops Old Town Cleveland, has released a regional history book, Confederate Voices. The book is available at the Red Ribbon, the Museum Center at Five Points, and at www.oldtowncleveland.com. And be sure to tune in every Saturday morning at 10 for Old Town Cleveland, right here on Whoop FM. Hokies Restaurant and Sports Bar on Sahara Drive in Cleveland has got great food, live bands, karaoke, pool tables, darts, and more. Plus, check out daily lunch specials Monday through Friday from 11 to 2. That's not all. Hokies has got a brand new dinner menu with steaks, chicken, pork, and seafood dinners, and they're all delicious. Stop by and enjoy an appetizer, a specialty drink, lunch, or dinner anytime at Hokies. And be listening for the new Wheel of Whoop with your chance to win cash. Coming soon to Pokies, Sahara Drive, right here in Cleveland. Proudly serving the area since 1989. Call Pokies today at 476-6059. Wheeler Technologies has moved. Visit them at their new location at 490 Grove Avenue Southwest next to Bradley Rentals. Same great folks, same great service with a better location to serve you. Call Wheeler Technologies for voice, data, and security needs at 664-TECH. That's 664-8324. And remember, depend on Wheeler Technologies for the current time and temperature every day at 476-1111. Tennessee Alarm Contractor C1750. Just me. 
Welcome back to Old Town Cleveland here on Whoop FM 99.9. Or you can go to the internet at www.whoopfm.com. Call us here at 614-5553. We have Doc German here today and Will Moore talking about the Candy Creek documentary and, of course, Candy Creek itself. And I uh, want to uh, remind everybody the uh, DVD uh, and the I mean the documentary will be, have its first public showing tomorrow. It's free to the public at 3 p.m. at Walker Valley High School. So everyone, please come out. Doors will open around 2 o'clock. Be there. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Doc mentioned that motorcycle going across that bridge. Is that what started him into bike riding? <laughs> Probably excited him, Ed. <laughs> uh, what kind of motorcycle was that fella owned, Doc? He owned a Harley Davidson, older model, where you pumped up with a, a pumped oil up through the, between the tanks. So now, don't. Ed, just imagine what that'd be worth now. If we just had what we knew back a few years ago, we'd all be millionaires. <laughs> His name was Raymond Roddy. Raymond Roddy. When, yeah. when he left there, he told all of us boys that followed him up to the Swinging Bridge. He said he had some people up in Ohio, so I'm going up Ohio and be a Harley Davidson dealer. And I've never heard from him since to this day. But he was a... A daredevil first class. Now, that may have rubbed off on me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. You sounded good. Good morning to you. Oh, All good. Right. Thanks for calling, Ed. Bye-bye. Uh, we have a picture of Ed uh, with a guy named Snorts with no shirt on. I, he done lost his shirt out at Snorts, I think. Well, Snort <laughs> was Ed's neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I thought Ed may have lost his shirt. I, you know, I don't know, what's, I don't know what Snorts did. <laughs> I'm not going to say. <laughs> well, we well, saw. Uh, <laughs> we we talked about Highway 64 last week, and I think everybody pretty much figured out that. And I'd never seen a picture of Snorts because I always thought you just had this little square window around his in the door. Well, I've uh, drove my dad out there a few yeah, times, and I, basically, I'd seen Snorts' hand. Yep, <laughs> hadn't seen his face. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to change the subject. Up on the screen, we have a picture of the fellas that are building the flume line, and then that way it's easy to see that it was 14. They're standing on the inside of it. You can see that it's 14 foot tall. I think it's what one way it was nine foot, and one way it was 14 foot, whichever way it was. But I think what's so neat about these 19 teen pictures is that when they got ready to get their picture made, everybody always was holding whatever tool that they were in charge of. We see a surveyor here, and then a lot of times they'll have um, a carpenter square or just whatever tool they used all the time. And I understand that, um, especially when they were building number one, that each nationality, they brought in a lot of immigrants to work on that, each nationality had their specialty. And the Hungarians were the shovel operators. Now, I'm not talking steam shovel. I'm talking with your back and your arm shovels mm -hmm. and they decided that they were going to pay the hungarians half price because they felt like that was not uh skilled labor and so the hungarians a few of them showed up the next day with their cut their shovels cut in half and they said okay you made your point bring your shovel and you know get back to work and i thought that was pretty funny but uh also there was one guy that his job that he did all the time was just sharpen the blades because you got to understand all these were hand saws Right. I just want, once again want to talk about Southern Style Pro Wrestling. Going to be down in Dalton, Georgia next Saturday. Uh, autographs start from 5 to 7. And then the matches start at 7 o'clock. Uh, $10 to get in. About 10 matches. They're just a long list of some of the people going to be there. Uh, so And $3 go of that to the Wounded Warrior Project. So don't forget that. Hey, and don't forget to listen on Wednesday nights. Uh, and it, it's here uh, different nights because... Uh, uh, Doc Hollywood can't be with us every week, but he does Doc Hollywood's Dynamite D Dance Show, and it's the, featuring the best of the 70s, 80s, R&B, and disco, and uh, uh, only like Doc Hollywood could do it. So don't if you get a chance, tune in on Wednesday night, 6.30, 8.30, and hear Doc Hollywood's Dynamite Dance Show. And I'd like to mention that uh, uh, our theme, show, uh, theme song for our show, I'll get that right, is written by John Cook. Uh, John Cook uh, recorded this song called Old Town Cleveland, a song he wrote about him and his brother. And we thought it just a very appropriate song for our show and thus became the name of the show, Old Town Cleveland, from 
his song old town so we'd like to thank john and john has a part to do with the documentary we asked john if he would write all the original music for the documentary uh, every song in there except two songs are original songs that are written and recorded by john cook uh, some of them are just subtle songs playing in the background during the interviews but uh, the opening number uh, is uh, called tuner field trolley which was a, sort of the nickname of the uh, little uh, trolley it ran back up uh, down through there and that the opening songs there and the uh, closing songs called coming home and uh, so uh, that's the ending song and then there are other songs throughout there and he recorded another old gospel song that we used the, just the musical part of it and then we use a 1920s sort of a dance tune that uh we got that. Doc will uh, be up doing the Charleston. He'll be it. doing the Charleston. <laughs> so, I want to thank John Cook for being the documentary, and then uh, uh, there are just so many people to thank in there. You know, uh, David Swafford uh, 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 and I and Deb went to uh, Atlanta and done some research at the uh, National Archives and unbelievable stuff we found there. We found all the records, uh, Doc, of the Tennessee Electric Power Company versus TVA, There's and a bunch where of them. and where they had to buy them out, and we found things in there that told us how much your daddy made and what he did and what all the other workers did and it's pretty amazing to do there uh josh disney was a help with sound uh on there uh the national park service uh, uh tva uh, cherokee national forest. cherokee national forest uh, i mean they're just a long list of people <coughs> and then the people who provided pictures and stuff is a long long list and uh uh, I think that's the neat thing about this documentary in the book is that um, all of these pictures were out there, but everybody had three or four of them, and they mm -hmm. hadn't all been put in one place. Yeah, and we found some in the National Archives, and, that, and, yeah, and as late as this week, we found more great pictures, Doc, <laughs> some that we had never <laughs> seen before. I was so frustrated. Uh, they're not in the book or in the uh, documentary, but... Uh, uh, just, just great I finally pictures. found a good picture of the tennis court, Doc, and I'll get you good. one of them that you can see the, the rock stacked up against it and the court, and then you can <laughs> see the hotel in the background. And I thought, now, where was that when I was trying to fit, find a picture of the tennis court? I do have a lovely picture of your sister playing tennis on the tennis court yeah. or standing next to the net with an unknown young man. And then all of the women talked about the young men that would come to play tennis from all the big cities like that town and... Cleveland. I know why they came. We had the prettiest girls everywhere around. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've heard too. Well, I love the Lowe sisters too when they're on the video. Uh, Marilyn and and Geraldine talk about their dad worked at Candy Creek and their mom's family, the Runyons, lived down next to Coy Dam Number One. And they met and they were like courting. And he took her up to the top of the flume line to propose to her. And you, you she know, said yes. Take the, me down. Miss <laughs> Kirkland and Miss King, which were the Lowe's. Right. Uh, uh, and there's some talk about you in there a little bit, I think. They. Uh, <laughs> oh, everyone has something to so say about Everybody Doc. has something about Doc, I think. Well, we took most of it out, Doc. But, yeah. Because you know, it, right. it was... We it was just it, was, it wasn't family friendly. It was, this is a family friendly. <laughs> no, 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 we're just they're kidding. just teasing. But I grew up literally out down the street from Miss Kirkland and Miss King when I was a little boy. And I never knew that they and not until we started doing a documentary that deb says well kirkland and king and i said yeah then finally i said oh i know those people i mean yeah. yes i know and uh did i ever tell you about our ice cream truck no, no. tell us about the ice cream truck well I have not heard we had one. an ice cream truck that come up through there on friday morning and drove a sparky watson out of mayfield truck out of athens he'd blow his horn down at the lower end of what we call the village of kenny creek and we'd all run, take off running up to the swinging bridge, and he'd open up any kind of pack on that truck and sell us popsicles or ice cream or whatever we had on the truck. Then he'd come back by the late Saturday afternoon, and he'd stop at the swinging bridge and blow again. So we had uh, Sparky Watson drove that truck, and I met him in later years, and he's a real nice man. Now, a, uh, how fast could you run when you heard that horn? Oh, I'd run 200 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and they uh, also had ice delivered every day and had newspapers delivered every day. Right. Well, now tell us about Otto. Otto Stamper. Otto Stamper. He's related to some stampers up here in town, I think, did he? <laughs> well, he had a store down in Okoye. He sold, he sold everything in that store. 
he'd call every house on Thursday afternoon, get their grocery order. Then on Friday morning, he'd come up through there with a pickup covered pickup truck, and the workers there at the firehouse would send a flat car and a dinky down there to unload them groceries and deliver them to what house ordered what. That's amazing. So the women didn't have to shop. That's right. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Hey, Ron. Hey. This fellow cry. I was just going to holler at Doc and tell him he didn't only live up there. We went to work up there on the road in 1957 from number one down to Greasy Creek. So I asked him about that. We had some times on that. Yeah, he's grinning real big. Yeah. He's told me about helping rebuild the road up there. Right. Now, are you related to the Christ that lived at Kenny Creek? Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, what all, was your... all Christ are kin folks. <laughs> that was Manny and uh, and Frank. And you said your name's Philip. Yes. Oh, Philip Cry. Yeah, I'm, I know him. Yeah. yeah. Doc, hey, so. I was just going to holler at you and let you know. All righty. We hope to see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Uh, Doc, I found a newspaper article this week from 1923 that said Tennessee Power Company and the state of Tennessee shared the expenses to rebuild the road around the river. So they lived there basically almost 10 years before the road was rebuilt. Then it was just a pig trail. Yeah. But the state of Tennessee spent $16,000. And Tennessee Power Company spent sixteen thousand dollars to build probably five miles of road. That's a pretty amazing price sure compared is, to. <laughs> yeah. Now the Tennessee Electric Power Company. It was started out uh, as e East, East Tennessee, Tennessee Power, Power, then become Tennessee Electric Power Company. Tepco. Tepco. Tennessee Electric yeah. Power Company. Uh, they had an office building here in Cleveland, right across from where Cleveland Chair, where the one it burned. Right. Mm -hmm. They was a down there, and they had a big switching center down there too. Do you think the switching center was down there, Doc? Did you ever hear? I don't remember. It. Okay, that, that was before my time, I'd it say. Is. And then Tennessee Electric Power Company's original offices. The building is still standing. It's the big, tall building with all the windows busted out next to Finley Stadium down in Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. You'll see it if you're facing Finley coming around on the highway. It'll be off to the left, and you know uh, the people. Of course, it's it's in disrepair now, quite quite badly, but. Uh, that was the Tennessee Electric Power Company mm -hmm. uh, offices. But, but see, Chattanooga being, a, I mean, Cleveland being a switching station also got power to the woolen mills and stuff. Yeah, right. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Good morning, Ron. Hey. I just wanted you to ask Doc if he remembers Kay Reimer, married to Eugene Harper from up at Reliance, that lived uh, over at. Vainly, uh, I remember that. Now, is Kay going to be able to come be with us tomorrow? We're, we're planning on it. I just talked to her, and, and we're planning on being there just a little after 2. Well, good. Sounds She's good. 90. She'll be 92 April the 10th. Okay. Now, wow. now, did she tell us who she was related to at Candy Creek? Well, now, I can't name all of them. <laughs> well, I She's think. She's probably related to all of them. Julius. Well, she, she was, she's my aunt by marriage. She married my dad's brother, Gene Harper. Okay. And uh, she lived there with her grandparents, and so I'm not sure if it was the Reimer grandparents or her mother's grandparents. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. But I'm sure she'll be able to tell you tomorrow. She, I would uh, think. I know that the Reimers lived there. There were yeah. a couple different sets of Reimers, and I think the name Julius I have seen Reimer. Julius and of course, Reimer was her father. Okay, and then I have seen, um, of course, AC. Uh, I mean, I his middle name was Columbus. I don't know Arthur McClellan. Now, he lived up at number three version down. Yeah. He, did. His wife was Minnie Green. Yeah. So Merrill was also lived in Kenny Creek. One of Kay's sisters married a Merrill. Merrill. Okay. Yeah, so there's two sets of Merrills lived in there. And Kay said that her grandfather uh, was at Powerhouse 2. He worked at Powerhouse 2. Yes. Well, we'll have to get his name for sure. And, uh, so we'll see you tomorrow. Well, thank well, you thank so, you so much, much for bringing her and, and tomorrow. And please come oh, up yes. and say hello. We, yes. We'd yes. like to meet everybody. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Isn't uh, that fun? So we're going to have some, I mean, her grandparents lived there, and she lived there with them, I think, quite a bit of the time. Now, uh, it's going to be easy to say if you if your family grew up in, uh, maybe even up in North Georgia or down Tinga area, down that part, Bradley County, Polk County, that in the early days when they start building this flume line, it's very possible you have family that worked on the flume line. Mm 
Because oh, it's where all the jobs were here. A lot of the people after uh, uh, Kenny Creek disbanded, a lot of them moved around Benton and Okoy, which uh, uh, Trotters and Greens, and quite a few of them lived. We come on into Cleveland later, but most of them, uh, I'd say half of them, moved around Benton. Now, when you moved Okoy. into Cleveland, you didn't have power, did you? We moved in one house, didn't have any power or indoor toilet or no water. Now that's we didn't you, stay there too long. But that's <laughs> after you'd lived in the middle of the mountain. Now, we're talking about in yeah. rural, in, in 1930, we've been a rural part of, uh, you know, power. And I know my dad came back from Korea, that he went to work for Volunteer Electric, and he was helping build power lines through Poe County. That's what he did. He, exactly uh, right. That's back in the days when you didn't have those trucks that dug the hole. You had to dig them by hand. Exactly. And yeah. so, uh, uh, so they d put pole lines. So, you know, we're talking about lots of parts of Polk County. Bradley County did not have powers until the 50s. And they, we're right. talking about an area. Now, Doc, how much did your dad make working there in the switch? $26 a month. Got it in a yellow envelope. A month. A month. And you got right. it in a yellow envelope. Yeah. Well, and yellow so that envelope. means they paid their employees cash. Cash. Came yeah. in an envelope. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Because there wasn't a bank around. No. Then on Saturday mornings in the summertime, we would catch an old school bus. I don't know where it came from. We'd catch it there at the Swinging Bridge, and we'd go to Ducktown and shop in Ducktown and come back at 3 o'clock that afternoon. That was a big deal for us, because Ducktown was a, to us was a big town back in those days. Up in the Copper area, right? Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. That, uh, but uh, $26 a month. and uh, But now, uh, that was a lot of money. That that You know, $26 a month was probably more than most common workers was making working down here at the woolen mill in cleveland uh so they were high paid although they weren't you know well, you know. At, that, at that at that day and time we got our house free and the water and lights and all too it was furnished and uh so we just had to pay uh, uh for groceries and if you, uh, my dad has once had a car back in those days and mr belt mr vineyard just parked on the far side of the river and uh, at most of the time, that's the only vehicles they were around there. My dad had an old A model. Mr. Belk had an old Plymouth. Mr. Vineyard, I think, had an old Dodge or something like that. And uh, sometimes they'd get broke into by people going up and down the road, but not very much. There wasn't a lot of still out no, on there. No, there wasn't too many people. Yeah. Well, you didn't have an eight-track eight okay. player or <laughs> no, a player. Really no, no, there's no plane wore yeah. out a car. I think later they actually built garages there. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Now, the uh, in Ducktown, which had been a very similar type community, not, but not on the river, that all that was company houses, too. Was it not? Because copper, uh, copper company owned those houses. Yeah, and then... They didn't sell them up until... Uh, probably 15 or 20 years ago yeah we, we had a guy on here uh, mr helton come in and he uh, uh him and mr rush come on and he talked about that they finally got to buy the house they lived in but mm -hmm. uh, it was either free or very cheaply cheap rent you know yeah and uh, done that and this thing with canning creek is that and, and not there's very and few if companies anything broke the, the power it. company fixed it or the the guys that worked there fixed it. And they painted it. Yeah. it for you and everything, right? Oh, yes. They kept it up real good, too. See, Miss uh, Green talks about that uh, on the video. And she says, you know, when Tennessee Power Company had it, you know, everything was paid for. But when TVA took over, you paid for everything, she says. Yeah, you had to start paying rent then. Everybody. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. your dad was the very last one to move out of Caney Creek. Everybody started moving out after the, and I'll talk about after this. After TVA took over. Took over. And, uh. And tell them what they told your dad. They told my dad if he didn't move, they was going to let him go. We go stayed on. there a year and a half after everybody else moved so, so out. So they're going to fire him, eh? You're going to fire him, yeah, <laughs> if he right. didn't move out. So uh, we stayed there a year and a half after everybody else moved out. And, of course, every, every, just about every house left uh, quite a few things like tricycles and bicycles. And we was boys, of course, next we got all that and rode it there. Rode all them around, and I found a stern wheel one time, and I put it on my tricycle. <laughs> <laughs> Don, all we have been it. Uh, 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 tell us about Sam Wilcox. Sam Wilcox was a great, great man, full of energy. He lived over on Kimberly Highway on uh, at Greasy Creek, Archwell, they call it, modern name. He'd walk across that mountains every morning and every night, regardless of the weather, with a lantern. 
and he never missed a day, and he's always first one on the job every morning, and he'd be the last one to leave at night. I don't know how long he lived, lived but uh, he much should have lived a long time, but he really got to exercise. Well, that, you know, it, you don't see workers like that anymore, do you? No, no way. Oh, um, we were talking about earlier about the whole community part, um, and I really do believe this is a community project. I mean, because we could not done it alone. Like, um, we have found great pictures, um, a whole lot of um, memories that we'd never heard of through sources my mom found. Um, we know we couldn't run this without the Bradley County Historical Society. Uh, they actually gave us a little bit of a grant to help us f fund this, and without them, we know we wouldn't have thought this through. I mean, well, we just wouldn't have had the right. We had good. We don't have professional equipment, but we have good uh, personal equipment. Right. That that you would just use at your house to make films and movies and stuff, and and we were able to. Uh, and it was a big chunk of money for the historical society to give. Right. And to hand it over to a twenty year old was quite. Uh, they had a lot of confidence in you. Good morning, live on Old Town Cleveland. Hey. Dennis Stafford, one of your favorite listeners. Hey, hey, Dennis. hey, Dennis. How you doing? I always say hello to Philip Cry. What a wonderful guy. Great guy. Strong with that bear. But I want to ask you, the gentleman there, does he remember the engineer Benjamin Mark Anthony? Benjamin Mark Anthony, an engineer. All I remember about him is his name. But as far as knowing him, I don't ever remember seeing him or talking to him and like that, but the name is very, very familiar. Yeah, he was the one that was the engineer design that flume down there, and uh, he lived here in Cleveland for years. He, he got involved in an accident up there on the river and was pretty messed up real bad and had a severe limp in his walk, and uh, he used to walk up and down Keith Street uh, with that limp, but he, he was one of the uh, major, I guess. Uh, what was his name? Yeah. Actually, his name was Benjamin Anthony, but because his name was Anthony, they called him Mark. That's the Cleopatra. They called his wife. Mm -hmm. Cleopatra. Uh, 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 the and how did you know him? Oh, I've known him for years before he passed away. I, we had talked about this one time before, mm -hmm. uh, and you had had this similar program on, and I promised you I would get you a picture of Mark, and I have it in my wallet at my house. Okay. And I will bring you a picture. He and his wife, he had four children. Two of them are oncologists. At, uh, one of them was a leading oncologist at Vanderbilt. One of them was a Chase Paul Horton president of the bank in New York. And one of the, gir gir the girls, the guy was a, a manufacturer of uh, drugs. He had a drug manufacturing company in Southern California. But wow. he put four people through Vanderbilt as an engineer at the TVA. That's amazing. Well, I'm glad you shared that with us. That's uh, I think it make, means a lot to you, too, when you knew him in person. Oh, yeah. He's, he's a great guy, a wonderful person. And uh, he was just so proud of his children and proud of being in Cleveland. Uh, so, anyway, I thought I'd leave that with you. All righty. Thank you very much. Uh, Ron has just put up a picture of the village, Doc, and we can see... The small, there was two vehicles that went through the village there. We had just the trolley that was used to move small stuff and people to work. The trolley would show up in the morning. And the trolley would show up in the morning to take people to work and bring them home in the afternoon and, and to move things around there. And then there was also a, a full-size steam engine that they would use like in um, what would normally be used like in lumber yards and stuff. Well, they'd unload the lumber down to the wharf, down Madden Branch, and they'd bring it up those railroad tracks, pulling up with that steam engine. Now, I understand when the, everything was sold, that engine went to Silver Dollar City, which is Dollywood now, mm -hmm. what I've always been told. And you see our big schoolhouse up on the screen there mm -hmm. now. I think it's about... Uh, 20 foot long, 14 foot wide, but it served the purpose and also it served as a church on Sunday. Now, to the left, was that your outhouse? What's well, that behind the schoolhouse? Is that building? your outhouse behind the. Or is the, that like a little. 
storage. Little building right behind to the no, left. No, I, I, I think that was the outhouse up on the hill there. That was so small, and it probably didn't have running water and stuff to it. No, I wouldn't think so, mm-hmm. not the schoolhouse. And then right there by the schoolhouse was a side track where they would park, like, the engine. Now, there's a great yeah. story in this um the students, Mrs. Trotter's students at um, Blue Ridge in 1982, must have been one of the last years that she taught, helped put a book together, and they interviewed her mom and dad, Mr. and Mrs. Trotter, which would had been in their 80s at that time, um, about living at Candy Creek and stuff. And one of the stories they told us, I really enjoyed it, it said that the, the steam engine there, they finally made a chute that would shoot the sparks that would come up out of that when they were running it through the village out towards the river so they wouldn't catch their houses on fire. And I thought that was really funny. But uh, uh, the engine was sold later. There was also a tugboat that was a part of the operation that would push now the that barge. that was a handmade tugboat, wasn't it? I understand it was a homemade kind of tugboat. They had just made it, and there's a picture of it in the book and in the documentary. And it would chug things up and down the river. Well, when they got ready to sell off all the stuff after TVA took over and said, we're not going to do this anymore, um, they sold that to somebody for $15. Kerbo, I, I think. Was it one I, of the, I've heard about that, yeah. I've and heard about it. when they started taking it, when they got it down to the lake and were trying to take it wherever they were going to get it out of the water, came up a big storm and they tied it up at Max Point. And when they came back, it was underwater. May still be underwater as far as we know. Uh-huh. Uh, the Tennessee Electric Power Company, uh, of course, formed in 1909 or 10, and then they started building the dams and all that. The uh, uh, They ran until 1936 or 1938. Uh, in 1936, a major thing happened in America. Uh, Congress and Roosevelt si- signed the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority Act, and Tennessee Valley came and told Tennessee Electric Power Company that they're now going to take over this dams and all that. And, and Tennessee Electric Power Company says, no, we don't want to sell. And now <laughs> this time they were providing power to Cleveland all the way up towards Knoxville, over towards Crossville. They were serving power in a lot of places. So they cheap. became you know, a very An big, big company. Uh, they had started out just to provide power for Chattanooga and the industry, and now it spread into households around through the <laughs> area. And they said, no, we don't want to sell. And TVA says, you have to sell. And we're going to make you sell. And so the next thing we know, after court battle after court battle, this ended up in the Supreme Court of the United States. And there was a large battle in the Supreme Court. And basically the Supreme Court come back and ruled that Congress, by their signing the bill, had given the authority to all waterways to the Tennessee Valley Authority and thus Tennessee Electric Power Company had to sell. They got $2.7 million for the Parksville dams. Now, they got more money for the rest of all the other, but for the dam up there itself the, in the flume line, I think it was $2.7 million. And at this point, that's when TVA came and took over, and now no longer did you have free houses. As a matter of fact, they said, we don't have company houses, and they were going to shut the village down, and they... While you were still living there before you moved, you had to start paying rent, as Miss Green will point out in the DB in the uh, documentary. You had to start paying r- that. You had to start paying for water. You started paying light. And Lawrence German just was, well, let's say, stubborn. Was that a good word? Stubborn enough not stubborn. to move? I, I think so. Stubborn yeah, was a good yeah. word. He well, liked we, we living enjoyed there. living there too. And so, and that's why these people moved, and that's why this village then was dismantled and moved out, and basically that's. Uh, why they're just the foundation because like once again these foundations were made out of the same concrete the dams were being made out of and the powerhouse and those foundations are going to be there a long time now now some of the houses had wooden foundations yeah, and, and, and rocks and, and stuff yeah. and they're gone but uh, just like i say the and the tennis court will be there a long time it's got trees growing up through it now but uh uh <laughs> and Doc, say, now please don't rush out today and try to go up through there like say TVA and and the National Forest Service would prefer you don't go there now. I think is that true? Right. They they don't want you to go there. Although you could visit. You have to have an employee. With yeah. You. And uh, now there are people come in on the backside of the river. And if you do go, just be respectful. This is uh, right. th- this is almost like a monument now to to the not mo- just a monument to the people who live there. It's a monument to progress. This is progress. This is things that happen. 
uh, that created what you live in today, the, the power that you have today and, and the recreation you have up there. All that's part of that. So if you do go, please be respectful to that area. TVA taking over was kind of a bad thing, but we have to realize that Tennessee Power Company had nothing to do with flood control necessarily. And TVA provided the recreation and the flood control and, and really cheap power for us. Doc, I had a question about the engine. When the engine came through the railroad tracks by the house, did they sound a bell or something? Or Sometimes they'd ring their bell. They had one on the engine. Like Most a big time, cast iron bell? Yeah, uh, you can see it outside the engine. Most time they'd ring it ever so far, you know, so the kids wouldn't get out on the railroad track. <laughs> Something else I meant to tell you a while ago. All the kids that I knew that was raised in Kenny Creek, but almost all of them, what I'd call, amounted to something that they left there. Most of the ladies become school teachers. A lot of the boys, I know several of them become engineers. A lot of them switchboard operators. About all of them made a pretty good living that they left there. Some of them race car drivers? I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doc, didn't your brother and you uh, build some kind of little race car up there, maybe at Parksville instead of at... Uh, I built one in Parksville. And how did that go for you? Well, it come down the hill wide open, me riding it, <laughs> driving like a, it. Would it be more like a soapbox derby? Similar, kind of? similar like a soapbox derby, except a little bit bigger. So you rode it down the hill towards the river. That helped make me a stock car driver. Uh, <laughs> How did Later. you stop? Didn't stop. You didn't stop. <laughs> He's, He's still going. going. <laughs> He's still going. One thing that you can see there at the Parksville Complex is the trestle for the bridge that used to bring the train in there. And I'd always seen that and just thought it was a regular bridge. But when you go down to where the picnic tables and things are, you can see a concrete trestles. That's what I wanted to call it, um, where the railroad track used to run. And there's wooden ones before that that washed away in the 1920 flood. Now, that 1920 flood must have been something, Doc. It must have been. Because that's the one that flooded Candy Creek, and they talked about washing the mud and stuff away, and it washed away that big uh, railroad, wooden railroad trestle there that crossed the river. But there are pictures of it um, in the book of the of the wooden bridge yeah. but you can still see that and you can still go stand on the western side of the dam there and see you know the powerhouse and stuff now doc there was a steam plant there too in Parksville. what did it do well it made uh they'd fire it up and make electricity if the case the water got low behind the dam and they didn't have enough water to turn the turbines inside number one powerhouse Parksville. And that track went from uh, Parksville all the way to Old Fort where they got coal off mm -hmm. the uh, uh, lines that went up and down 411 Highway. So it carried coal up to the... Carried the coal up to the steam plant that Parksville. Yeah, someone had to burn to create the steam. The steam mm -hmm. uh, They didn't the use that steam plant much, did they? I never seen it uh, operate except maybe one time. I worked on that uh, uh, line up through there about four, five, six months one time replacing cross ties under that thing. I worked for a man called Dewey Messer, and uh, I'd watch the engine go old fort and pick up the railroad or the coal in the cars and bring them back up the steam plant. Then they'd unload them cars, and uh, then they'd take them back over to old fort. But in 1953, I heard they was going to blow that... Uh, uh, the smokestack up? Yeah, uh, blow it up. So I rode a motorcycle up there to watch them destroy that uh, uh, tire. Up you just want to yeah. see something blow up. Yeah. 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 Well, now, yeah. Doc, yeah. in the really old pictures, like when they're building the, the Koi Dam, this um, the, the northern side of the hill was huge, and it came real close to the dam. Did they remove that hill? I don't Where really the road know. Is now? I don't. I don't think so. Okay, I think they might have removed they had some. They something to cut the road through. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But now that was the that was the. I can't imagine that somebody on horseback would just look up there and go, "Hey, that gorge is not very wide. Let's dam it up, and make well, electricity." I mean, you go through there and you can see that gorge wasn't very wide. Well, let me ask you a question here. I know just change the subject just a little bit here, quick. That uh, uh, you your first major project is done now. 
So what are we going to do next? <laughs> well, um, I know we've been in talks with um, doing the Speedway documentary. It's a Cleveland Speedway, right? Cleveland Speedway, yeah. Uh, it will be 60 years old next April. And ironically, one of the first people to race at that very first race 60 years ago is sitting next to you here, Will. <laughs> Doc German raced in the right. very first race at the Cleveland Speedway. That's sort of ironic, isn't it? They, they opened up March 25th, 1954. And March 54. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. 54 I thought it was right. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So, uh, that's right. It'll be 60, 60 years. So, that, uh, uh, what kind of car did you drive that first day? 1934 Ford. <laughs> did you win? Not that first time. Uh -huh. Did you win after that? I sure did. Yeah, well, that, that's good. So, but and yeah. your brother I, Cooney was racing too. Yes, I had a brother that raced all the time. Yeah. Now, the, uh, uh, so, well, that, uh, start soon and what we really need from people is video and pictures and, eight and stories i mean if you drove that's good if your family drove if your grandfather drove any stories that you had that you can pass down any type of old eight millimeter films videos from any era from the 54 all the way to uh 2004 or 2014 coming up we need videos to use and then we need pictures. If you're if you have a if you have an old helmet that your grandfather rode, we'd like to have a picture of that helmet. Uh, anything that you have, and you don't have to have been a racer. You could have been a fan and film things or old programs, whatever you have, old stories. We'd like to have them. You can contact us here at Woof FM, and we'll be glad to try to include that in the documentary. We probably have forty or fifty hours of film will for the uh Candy Creek documentary? Maybe not quite that much. Oh around that much. It yeah. seems like that much when I watch yeah, it over it's... and over and over again to and write the we have hundred there are literally hundreds of pictures in the documentary and we have hundreds of pictures we just didn't have stories in time. You know, like we had some great video and the guy in the Harley just ruined right. some really good stuff and uh you know, then just we find minor mistakes that we just dropped out. And right. Well, it was funny, too, that we didn't realize. I, Doc had taken me to Candy Creek in February, and bugs were not a problem. No. But when we went back in March or April, whenever it was last year to, uh, I believe it was March, uh, to record, it was noticeable to me, probably not noticeable to the audience, but you can see all these little bugs flying around. What? But they were beautiful wildflowers oh, then. Gorgeous. That was the amazing thing yeah. about last April. There were um, one of the funny things about going back to shoot at Canyon Creek was um, the um, technical issues we had up there. <laughs> um, the night beforehand, we had one camera completely fry. A good camera. A very nice camera. Um, uh, we had one or two people cancel on us that were supposed to help us. And... There's probably something else that happened. Terribly. We broke every tripod we had at one point in time or another. By the end, we were just stacking up books at people's houses and set <laughs> yeah. cameras on them. Because, you know, you just think, well, and actually, see, there's things you don't realize till you start trying to do it. When you get in somebody's house and you got one of those big tripods, it takes up so much space and stuff. So we finally found that we could just move books and stuff and, and stack things up on it but it's like i said it is a community project just because like having someone like um whenever we didn't have someone to help us i told my friend josh who um has no idea what uh anything about media or audio and he ended up being our sound guy going up to candy creek he's a special education major yeah. <laughs> but you he tell him when and where he'll do it the best of his abilities uh, point the pole <laughs> yeah, point yeah. over this way. Well, one of the hardest things about um, filming up at Tanny Creek was actually about Doc. Um, <laughs> Doc, you don't ever stop moving. <laughs> no. And you don't ever stop talking. <laughs> no, I don't. So we would stop to um, set up our equipment, plan out the next thing. Every so everyone stops. Doc's still walking, and he's still talking. It, And so... Half the time, we were feeling like we were chasing after. The, There's he, one point in time in the video, we don't use it the, in the DVD, but it's really funny because Will's shooting a picture of himself as he's walking down the creek, and he goes, well, here is the number one problem we've encountered today. And he turns the camera, and Doc, you are so far away, you're just a little speck in the distance that Doc's entertaining 
and talking and telling stories. We had the supervisor from TVA there with us, and they were just going on without us. But we finally caught up and got some really good footage, oh, actually. Oh, great footage. Footage. Now, well, and you'll see the, the foundations yeah. in the DVD tomorrow, and you'll see we found pictures of the old houses, and then we switched right to... <clears throat> Excuse me. The pictures of the foundations makes it really interesting. Well, there something else happened, and unfortunately, you never uh, it, all of it never come uh, together. Is but right after the big announcement in the Chattanooga Times, you got a interesting telephone call right in the middle of class one night. Oh yeah, I almost forgot all about that. Um, I believe his name was was it Jules Al- Alexander? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, which he was was the uh, former member of the band, the Association. Correct yeah, name, yeah, the Wendy and the long time uh, Mary, and yeah, long time man, yeah. Um, he called and he has family members that were a part of Candy Creek. I can't remember which ones he said. Tell you from Dallas, was it? Yeah, he was calling from Dallas, and um, he just had a Associate Press uh, web page up on his uh, computer, which pulled up Chattanooga Times for him. Of course, so he he freaked out. And called me, so I'm getting a call from this award winning right, I mean this this band's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as far as I'm aware. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um It was kinda of fun to talk to him. Yeah. We we got another call from uh Texas. We got several emails. There were a lot of people that when we tried to return their calls or whatever, we couldn't make out what numbers phone numbers they were saying or we couldn't couldn't get back in yeah. touch with them. Th- that was a big problem when I, we I think prepared. I kept track where, yeah, we were not prepared. We for, were not prepared for the response. We we mm-hmm. thought we would get 20 calls. I think in about a week's time, I got 200. Wow. So, and I, uh, my parents can definitely vouch for this. I am not the most organized person in the world. No. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and to. Since when? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have a tendency Since to carry a <laughs> yes, to carry a, a pencil and paper with me and write things down. Well, Will relies on his phone to save things for him, and that kind of kind of had a little error there and lost some numbers and yeah, stuff. Like, but so, we still got in touch yeah. with a lot of people. Then, yeah, we got in touch and got a lot of great stories. And, I mean, I wish we probably should have put your number on there besides mine. Yeah, the, so. uh, the guy from the association said, "Well, Will, I, I'm writing a song about Candy Creek. Would you like to?" Uh, Use it, and we'll think him, Grammy winning guitarist, or, you know, Grammy mm-hmm. winning guitar artist, mm-hmm. and he's playing for some, done some things now. Wants to write a song for my documentary. Yes, let's do that. And he was going to come back and spread the ashes of a dead relative his at Candy Creek, but for some reason we never got there. Is some lack in conversation. But anyway, or something. Uh, uh, Will never would return will, our calls then. The phone rung in the middle of his class. Well, got to turn off his phone like he should have, you know. And the we're media majors. We and, never turn so off our phone. Turn, and the <laughs> his professor said, "Is that about the documentary?" Because they had read about Will being, and they had mentioned Chattanooga State too, so which they were proud of that. Right. He said, "Well, go on out, take out of that." And so Will goes out, and he's out for a few minutes. He comes back in, and the, the guy asked him in class. The professor says, "Will was what was that about?" He said, "Well, that's a." Uh, uh, Jules Alexander from the band Association wanting to write a song for the documentary. You know, and here's the uh, professor going, here's 21-year-old kid students, you know, <laughs> getting this sort part. of amazed about yeah. all, the, all the stuff's going on. But uh, Now, the, I'm going to say one thing. I think about it. I had to say it when I think about it, Will, yeah, or right. I'll start thinking about pizza. Right. Uh, it's going to be my next thing. What was I going to say? Uh, <laughs> I think you- now I really forgot. Uh, we're going to have more showings of the documentary we than we uh, just uh, just a bit uh, there. We'll, we'll probably show it somewhere in the Polk County region and probably up in the Copper Hill. And there's some other people that uh, have asked to see it, some historical societies. Uh, so there'll be some additional showings. Uh, uh, WTMB, their local cable channel five, uh, most likely will show it coming up here soon. Uh, that's uh, Joe says he wants to do that. So. Uh, that's not finalized yet, but uh, just want to know that there'll be other viewings for it. And you can uh, find out more about all of it at oldtowncleveland.com. www.oldtowncleveland.com. Click on the tab that says Caney Creek on there. So the, We got a call before we went on the air, and somebody was asking about purchasing the DVD and stuff mm-hmm. that they don't have a computer and stuff. And for the time being, it's not going to be in the local stores. We might have something there in the next few weeks. Right. Um, but 
we'll let you know next week where you can find the DVD if you don't make it to the documentary tomorrow. Right, and like that, they will be for sale there. And then Deb has a, Deb also did a book of picture, a lot of pictures that we didn't get to use in there, and it tells a story. It's a sort of it's a, it's a 60, skeleton yeah, of a story. It's a sixty-eight page book. It has about nearly a hundred pictures in it. It tells little stories about uh, about the dam and that coming on there. So it's just a companion to the DVD, and so. Uh, but uh, we're really uh, really looking forward to it. Once again, it's going to be uh, this. Uh, Sunday, tomorrow, March 24th at 3 p.m. at Walker Valley High School. The doors will open around 2, so you need to get there early because we're going to crank that DVD up at 3 o'clock. I want to thank all of y'all for making this documentary. It's uh, really a thrill for me to have it made. Well, Doc, uh, I think you're really going to enjoy it. I hope so. Like I said, Doc, Doc, has, Doc has not seen the single foot of it. Not no. one thing. Thanks uh, for making it. Yeah. Well, well you're hey. welcome, Doc. And thank you for participating. And, and we called some people that didn't want to participate. They didn't want to, they wanted, they wanted to tell They wanted to tell the story, but they didn't want to be on film. And I needed people that would step up to the plate and talk on film. And, boy, uh, Doc walked in a studio with the bright lights and the big cameras and all that and Acted like he had done that all his life when he told those oh, stories. He, he's a star. And then his second shooting was done outdoors at Candy Creek. And when we could catch him, he did a really good job there. I think he's in better shape, all uh, of us. We went, oh, that's... <laughs> and Will and I went on the road. We went to Alcola and got Mrs. Linger Felton. And we went to uh, Blue Ridge and got Mrs. Trotter. And we went down on Dalton Pike and got the Low Sisters. And so... We, you know, didn't. It, it was really nice that they were that close and we could just get to them. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left in the show here. We've got Doc German and Will Moore with us today. Doc German was a resident of the little community called the Candy Creek Village up in the Okoy River area. And Will Moore uh, and his company, Will Moore Media, has produced a, uh, a documentary. A 40, it's a 47-minute documentary. I think Deb said a 45. I think it actually turns out to be 47 uh, Will Moore Media also does, uh, tell us what all you do. You do photography work? Um, yes, I do a lot of photography work. Um, For weddings? and Weddings, events. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also have a sound system rental where you'll do DJ work for... Uh, uh, Mostly same thing, weddings, events, and birthday parties. Anybody will pay you? Anyone that pays. For I anything, mean, yeah. I'll, I'll clean your car if you pay enough. <laughs> <laughs> starving artist right right starving artist so well good so if you need that you can call you at uh 715-2399 that's 423-715-2399 or you can go to willmoremedia.com mm -hmm. also and find him there too uh but. you can also get some more information on more photography at facebook mm -hmm. okay facebook uh folks you can call us here at 614-5553 we got about nine minutes left here to talk to doc german we hope to see you tomorrow at three o'clock at the walker valley auditorium there up on the north end of bradley county near charleston uh we hope you show up there uh the uh the omission is free yeah. free entertainment we decided we wanted to do that and just open it up to the public and we hope to have a big crowd there and i think we really will yeah now i will tell you that we thanks to the bradley county historical and genealogical society they give us a tremendous grant to help do this the rest of the program was paid for by the moore foundation <laughs> i call it the bank of mom and dad the bank yeah. of mom and dad uh, you know so we'll uh, sell in the dvds and the books to kind of make our money back yeah that's us. that's that's yeah. the key thing is the dvds to make money back from mom and dad yeah. that's, uh, that's and uh, then we'll it. have uh, pocket money to start our next project but uh doc i'm really excited about this project and i think that the racetrack uh, the Cleveland Speedway documentary will be a big one too. Uh, I, I think a lot of people are interested in it too. You've had a, so. you've had a most interesting life. Oh, we worked sure on, we worked on the, some of the uh, Cleveland Speedway last night. Working, so we have some ideals for the opening already. Uh, and of course, you do a documentary. It's not like you do a movie. You don't write. You don't say this is what we how we're going to shoot it. You get uh, gather everything together, then you say, this is what we got, and now you make a movie. Right. So it's according to what pictures we get and what movies we get to be how we make that. But, and we need that stuff now. Yeah. But we've got, Will, we'll tell you some ideals that we come up with last night. Will wasn't with us last night when we were doing this, but the opening, 
uh, has got a great idea for that. And then we got an idea, and uh, our buddy Dave Swalford, if you're listening, uh, you're going to be put to work on this. Uh, mm-hmm. And like He say, probably doesn't mind whatsoever. Well, Dave no, Swalford, yeah. uh, like I say, uh, drove us to Atlanta and got us into the National Archives down there, and uh, we went through – Oh, 50 boxes, Doc, of documents and pictures and things. It was... Phone's a, off. The phone is off? Yeah. Okay, well... <laughs> well, it's... Oh, uh, while you're talking... You never to- know when this button sticks here or not, so <laughs> it's open now, folks. There, there we, go. we go. There we go. Good morning, live on Old Town Cleveland. Yeah, Ron, I was going to ask Doc, uh, I just remember any, uh, any people named Stone Ciphers. Sure, I remember some Stone Ciphers. Well, my, my grandmother, uh, she lived in Tinga, and... I'm gonna have to go back and trace her family's history. Uh, I think there's a part of that too. Uh, but you, but you said you remember Stone Ciphers, right? Yes, I do. You think they were part of Candy Creek? Uh, I'll be honest with you, Deb. I'm not sure, but okay. Uh, I'd say she was kin to somebody there. Maybe had a sister or brother, something like that. Maybe. Well, my grandmother lived in. She was from Tinga. Uh-huh. Oh, is she? Yeah. Well, that's not too far uh, away. From I know about them Tinga folk now. Bullet. I remember reading too that. Um, there were a whole lot of people down at the Conasauga Lumber Company that their entire jobs were cutting the lumber to send it up to the dam and up to the flume line, too. I'm going to give you a dab and find out how I can. I think you go to the library up here. Maybe I, I'm going to try to trace her family. I've been trying to trace my Okay, well, you write down what you know, and I can help you from there. Okay, appreciate it. All righty, bye-bye. Uh, sorry about the phones there. Okay. And uh, you push these buttons here, Deb? Yeah. And sometimes it don't turn it off, and you don't know it. So well, that that's happens why occasionally. Somebody calls. Somebody so always calls. Here we go. Now we got it started. We we'll have to be here another <laughs> hour. Oh no! Good morning, you're live on Old Town Cleveland. Good morning. This is T Ben. Hey, hey T Ben. Hey T. How's Doc? Well, I'm a, I'm a moving pretty good this morning. Are you? <laughs> now I I called to remind Debbie about a fish truck we're running next Saturday. Well, we'll hope you have a beautiful day this time. Last time you about had frozen fish. Well, tell them about those special catfish you'll have. New cat, new catfish. <laughs> new, new, not used catfish fishes, but new. Yeah, it's a uh, mix between a blue cat and uh, those channel cats like I've been having. Uh huh. Hmm. And they're they're to clean the bottoms of the ponds, or yeah, they they uh fight like a bass according to that paper you got. <laughs> well, I might need to see that, but if people yeah. want to order fish, they can call you at 423-478-2405, or if they forget to order, they can just show up next Saturday, and you have containers yeah, we'll, and everything. We'll see what we can do, yeah. All righty. Sounds good, T. Thanks. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Now, where can you noodle a, a, a catfish like that? I wouldn't catch it with oh, my bare hands. I mean, if it fights like a bass, I don't know if you could noodle that or not. I'm not ever going to find out because uh, noodling is just not my ideal of a sport there. Stick your hand down in a hole, see if you can catch a catfish. That's not a good idea, not you see, yeah. No. Good morning, live on Old Town Cleveland. Uh, yeah, she was talk- I got a question. Sure. Uh, talking about the old phone line, did the, the powerhouse there, did one of the generators blow up at one time? It did. <laughs> it in did. In 1953, they hired a man from Ohio to, as an operator there. And undoubtedly, he didn't exactly know. I don't know where he knew what he was doing or not. But anyway, he let too much water come through there, and it blowed the turbine up there, and it blowed the side out of the number two uh, powerhouse that took uh, a couple of years to replace. And uh, that's the only incident I knew of big time up there. That was in 1953, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are pictures of the powerhouse. Yeah. As a matter of fact, when we went up there, the operator, Annette Moore, took me to the edge of the to the plant there and let me look inside and the big steel girders inside are bent from that explosion oh, yeah. so it, it was is. a huge yeah you remember that wheel yeah it was about been a foot or two in it probably was, it was kind of scary to think that it had that much force yeah i've noticed the side of it would have been a different color but yeah they had to replace that whole north side of it i believe probably three-fourths of that side of the building had to be replaced goodness yeah, from from the roof all the way to the floor. I mean, it blew. Uh, if you it blew you, it up. If you, you can find pictures of it probably on the internet. Uh, Doc, I don't think anybody was killed, but I think oh, those. Yeah, were, yeah, there's, there's oh yeah, yeah. The operator was killed. Whoa. Okay. He lived down on uh, uh, Walker Street or Trunk Street here in Cleveland at the time. Mm-hmm. 
Wow. I can't remember his name. That's been a long time uh, ago. I've read it, and I can't remember it either. But, yes, there was an incident there at Powerhouse Number 2 where it, it blew up. I think that there was a, a, a fellow that fell off the ridge there when they were building the uh, flume line, and he was killed. And there were a number of people killed when they uh, built a Koi Dam Number 1. There wasn't OSHA back then. <laughs> and you just dug a ditch, and you got down in it, and if it caved in... And Doc will tell you, too, this, there's all the old people will tell you, and they told Doc this, that, uh, you know, if somebody just fell in where they were pouring cement, they knew they couldn't get them out, so they just kept pouring the cement. Well, but that may be an urban legend, too. Yeah, well, true. Well, and your show is tomorrow at 2 o'clock? It's 3 o'clock. We're going to open the doors at 2. I suggest you be there a little bit after 2. Come on in and meet and greet us and um, then plan to stay, and we'd love to have you come. Well, I hope to make. I think it's going to be a fun <laughs> time for us to meet people that call in all the time that we know you, but we haven't met you in person. If you'll buy one of our books tomorrow about Can Creek, I'll autograph it for you. <laughs> <laughs> what a deal. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I did, by the way, go ahead and autograph a few books and Will and Doc, and I'm going to get John to autograph it so that they'll have three or four names in it. Because mm-hmm. I know a lot of people, since I put out this book in October, I found out people love autographed books. Now, uh, one person I think should doc, uh, sign the books as well, and I know he is not one to give himself much credit, but Ron Moore edit the entire documentary. So I would give him credit. Um, Thank you, but I'm just that little guy that sits in the back room. You know, yeah, you, you still you, deserve credit. You though. producers and writers and all that get all the credit. We want, I, we want him out in front of the whole crowd. He's bigger right. than all of them. Yeah. That's right. Well, Doc, if I get out in front, you won't see the rest of you. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> Doc, this two hours has passed by very quickly. And, and as you and Will were noting when the, we were on break, this is your 11th time to be on Whoop Radio. Yes, you, it is. Now, we're going to let you here at the end invite everybody tomorrow. So you. Everybody's listening today. Come to Walker Valley High School tomorrow between 2 and 3 o'clock. Let's get this Candy Creek deal on the road. Right. I've been, uh, ever since I got out of mountains, I've been spinning my wheels wide open. I need to slow <laughs> down a little bit. Nope. Uh, Don't slow down I, yet, Doc. I like Doc one time. He told me, I was trying to get, he said the way that the mountains were formed at Candy Creek, that during the winter time they barely had daylight. And I mm-hmm. said, well, how did that affect you? And he said, well, they just pumped daylight into us. <laughs> well, they provided everything. You so. turned out really good, Doc, for growing up a little country boy. So, Will Moore Thanks Media, tell us one more how to get a hold of you. Uh, you can call me at 423-715-2399. And so photography, video, uh DJ anything. work, uh, yeah. anything, car I mean, washing. I, I think the interesting about DJ work now is that you can almost play any song from any era now with the software and things that are right. available now. So if you want a song, yeah, you know, not that doesn't guarantee one hundred percent, but you know, genre wise, uh, I yeah, can give you yeah. any genre 50, you 60, want. 70, rock, damn. Well, thank I you, folks. Like, I always like a little extra Oops. rap. Yeah, yeah, I like rap music myself. Well, I've I've actually had parties where I've had to play Bollywood type music so it's i played everything okay good morning you're live on old town cleveland uh, yes i'd like to know if you could give me some information concerning the movie that's supposed to be at walker valley is it tomorrow yes ma'am uh the movie will show right at three the doors will open at two o'clock okay um, and if you go all the way around to the back left hand corner of the building uh-huh. that's where the auditorium's at and it's all on one level okay thank you we'd love to see you there uh, thank you. hope to see you there bye Right. Walker Valley, three o'clock tomorrow. The DV, I mean the <coughs> documentary uh, "Going Home" is uh, going to be shown. It's about Candy Creek. Uh, it's forty-seven minutes long. It will start right at three o'clock. So get there early, folks. Be sure to um, also stay around for the Q and A session. We'll have about. Um, I'm pretty sure all of us will be up there, and uh, we'll try to have as many. Kenny we're Creek gonna, families and, up there as well. We're going to invite anyone that would uh, that has lived there before to stand, and then we'll have some questions and yeah, answers. Yeah. It should be a fun time. Like I, say, I know at least three people that was actually in the documentary are able to be there tomorrow. So, uh, and some uh, just health will not allow them to be there. And uh, uh, so, folks, always uh, on Old Town Cleveland, we try to remember you uh, to save history. 
you got to do things like this. You got to get the pictures out from underneath the bed and out of the drawer. You've got to record your grandfather and your grandparents, your aunts and your uncles and your moms and dads, because we'll always know what happened at Pearl Harbor, folks. But we may not know what happened down your street or in your family. It's up to you to save history. Start today. We'll see you next week here on Old Town Cleveland. You're listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Pokey's Restaurant.